It's not on. Oh, there it is. Okay, I'm going to call this meeting to order. If you'll please rise. We have Pastor Tony for the invocation and Supervisor Liam Felter, if you'd lead us in the pledge. Thank you for the opportunity to pray for you. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your presence here in this meeting this morning, and we thank you for a wonderful country that we are blessed to live in. Father, we thank you for our county, and I ask that you bless each person that is a part of it. Father, I ask you to bless each of our county supervisors who are elected to serve the communities in which they live, and I thank you for their time and their expertise that they give to govern our county where, in our, where our families and our friends work and play. Father, I ask you to bless all of those here in attendance this morning. Help all of our discussions to be beneficial. Give each person wisdom and discernment and protect them as they make decisions that impact Mojave County and all of its citizens. May the discussions here bring you glory and be beneficial for our communities. Father, I ask you to be with all of those who are hurting and struggling and experiencing difficulties within our community. You know each one of their needs. I ask you to help them find direction, and may our communities be a source of hope for each one of them. I ask you to be with our first responders and our health care workers, be with our schools, the teachers and the kids, be with our local businesses, the owners and employees, and be with our churches and nonprofits as they reach out and minister. Father, may our communities, Mojave County, just continue to be blessed by you. May each one of its citizens recognize that they have a responsibility for the way that we are governed, and may we continue to participate in it. Help us all to come together and to support one another. I pray all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Father. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Motions call for an executive session to be held April 1st, 2024 at 9 a.m. So made. Second. Oh. There's a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Official business to come before the board. Discussion of pending contemplated litigation claims and demands. Mr. Esplin. Uh, good morning, Chairman. Nothing to report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Committee and our legislative reports. Supervisor Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. We had a public lands uh, meeting. It was started off by Greg Chilcott, Commissioner of Valley County, Montana. NACO is updating the code of conduct. We'll apply both in person and remotely. We got an update on old growth rule from the U.S. Forest Service, General McRae. Old Growth Amendment Lead, uh, U.S. Forest Service, Christian Kaiser, Thero Grabler proposed an amendment to the Forest Plan, EO14072, uh, dated April of 2022. All federal lands need to make an inventory of mature and old growth forest, analyze threats to that inventory. December 2023, formal step for informing agency to receive requests and information sharing was heard. Initial findings and decrease in mature forest inventory. Purpose of the amendment was to use the information for inventory and threat analysis to act to conserve and protect old growth. The amendment is to include statement of roles and contributions, a goal for braided indigenous knowledge and the science of managing these systems, management approach, desired condition statement, the reflect positive that will reflect positive outcomes to be achieved. An objective for measurable positive outcomes on the ground, a guideline to encourage proactive actions. We'll now analyze proposed actions prepared to EIS and draft EIS. County supervisors showed concern about language and the blanket end result of this amendment. Forest Service wants to include some members to be at the table working on getting that set up. Counties are not falling for this amendment. NACO lets them know this is this is their association. And they're here for uh, for us. Uh, WIR, Chief Government Affairs Officers, NACO is, is May 8th through 10th. And they'll have tours and workshops. The fly-in will be in September 11th through 13th. Legislative Assistant Joe Jackson is asking for feedback for the conference, suggestions about spreading messages to other entities other than the same legislatures in our own areas. 
Uh, Jackson also brought up H.R. 5030 would authorize secure rural schools for another five years. Has 59 co-sponsors. Appropriations are slowing things. Secure rural schools has expired, and they're relying on timber receipts right now. And during the open discussion, uh, Tammy Pearson serves as a National Bureau and Wild Horse Commissioner for BLM. She's trying to involve more legislatures in having a conference in Elko April 15th to 18th. Uh, Mika Christensen is concerned about one-size-fits-all for the control of mature forest growth. Time is slipping by quickly against having any NACO represent the counties. Against having only NACO represent the counties should be in conjunction with local county governments. Forest Service is blowing off the counties as they do not include counties up to this point. Too much diversity in forest to have one rule amendment, 128 different forests in the nation. Uh, uh, we, we stated that we didn't want NACO to be the only representative one to have individual counties also represented. Uh, I also attended the Quad State uh, meeting. Um, as you know, we gave money for litigation into the Joshua Tree. So far, we've run that. We're just waiting in, in case there's any uh, appeals. Um, but as we have seen none, uh, we're going to free up the money that we have set aside, and it'll go back to the general fund. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Very good. Thank you, Supervisor Johnson. Supervisor Gould? Nothing today, Madam Chairman. Supervisor Lingenfelter? Nothing today, Madam Chair. Supervisor Bishop? Um, just the, the typical meetings that I uh, attend every month, but I did get a request from uh, a constituent that uh, is requesting that we not use acronyms when we talk about um, things up here behind the DS. So uh, I attended the CSA, uh, which stands for County Supervisors Association, their uh, regular meeting and also their LPC meeting. LPC is Legislative Policy Committee meeting. And then I attended the ACJC meeting, which is the Arizona Criminal Justice Commission. Thank you. Thank you. And I, too, attended the County Supervisor Association um, LPC Legislative Policy Committee meeting. And with that, we'll move on. Do we have a lobbyist report today? Okay. Mr. Ponder. Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Nick Ponder again here discussing water legislation at the state legislature. Tomorrow, uh, in the House Natural Resources, Energy, and Water Committee, uh, Senate Bill 1221 will be heard. That is, uh, you'll recall, the bill that relates to basin management areas, um, and we've provided a lot of documentation to the board on the challenges with that legislation. Uh, last week, uh, Mr. Elters and Mr. Walsh and I had a conversation as well as uh, folks from the city of Kingman with Representative Gillette. Um, and he was asking for language to try and make the bill better. Um, I think that his uh, intelligence that was given to him was that a certain number of um, Republican and Democratic lawmakers were in support of 1221. I've doubled back and confirmed that that information uh, that he had received from other folks is unfortunately inaccurate, um, that there is not uh, robust support for the legislation. Um, and I think the message that came across to him is that the challenge with the current draft is that it doesn't meet the city of Kingman's needs um, and, and also uh, Mojave County's needs. Uh, we did provide him with areas of concern in the bill. Um, the areas are substantial um, and would effectively require any amendment to be a striker amendment, but um, at his request, we did share those. Um, I know that there have been conversations with uh, um, folks from Mojave County as well as uh, in the majority caucus as well as with the governor's office on what groundwater legislation would need to look like in order to pass and get a signature. Um, <clears throat> and those conversations are ongoing. Um, and I think 
what indications were given last week is that there that time is not necessarily pressing at this point in time. Um, there have not really been budget conversations going on at the Capitol thus far. Um, the indications I've been getting is that they're waiting for the next financial advisory committee to figure out what uh, funds will be and won't be available. Um, and so I think we're going to be here through the legislative session until uh, sometime in June. Uh, so we do have some time to work that out. But uh, but as it stands, 1221, you know, just it, it does not have the conservation needs that uh, would meet Mojave County's requirement. It doesn't have um, uh, it has the the groundwater rights uh, details that are that are of concern. So, uh, and those and actually, Mr. Je Gillette shared the concerns on the groundwater rights. So, um, we're working through that. Uh, in the Senate Natural Resources Committee this week, the HCR that I referenced the last time, uh, you may recall, Mr. Gould indicated to to be aware of a striker on that. Um, it is on the Senate Natural Resources calendar for Thursday. Right now, it's not annotated as a striker, but it, but they have until the end of the day tomorrow. So we will keep an eye on that to see if that has any potential for negative impact on uh, what the county is seeking to do. Uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. It's for Mr. Ponder. Nothing? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, we're going on to the county manager's report. Good morning, Madam Chair and board members. Um, I have a few items today, starting with, I'm very happy and pleased to report to you that Mojave County online permitting is up and running and is accepting electronic payment. All phases of records are available, so. Second item <clears throat> is related to ARPA funds. Recall, uh, $41 million was received by Mojave County. To date, uh, we have $31 million, which equates to about three quarters of the total, is already allocated or is on the agenda today to be allocated. That uh, leaves uh, $10 million remaining to be allocated. A deadline is December 31 of this year. Uh, the goal is to complete that task at the earliest, which is to allow for funding agreements and other arrangements um, to be made and to be in place by that deadline. Um, <clears throat> third and last relates to employment vacancies. I have been tracking and reporting to you on a regular basis. Our employment vacancies continue to be a challenge for us and um, is the result of a bigger concern. Since the beginning of this fiscal year, 2024, we have experienced more than 200 employees leaving county employments. And while that includes some retirements, a couple of dozens, and some dismissals, about a dozen to a dozen and a half, the overwhelming majority of these departures are resignations from tenured, productive, and valuable employees, including professional, technical, and administrative fields. That, in my humble opinion, Madam Chair and Board Members, translate into knowledge and experience leaving with them, and our ability to replace them is diminishing. <coughs> That is a major concern to me. It impacts our professional, it, it impacts our operational uh, functions and our ability to provide and sustain efficient services to our county residents. So it, it's of concern. Uh, we're trying to do a lot about it um, and we'll be discussing it more but doing system improvements, capturing practices and so on before people leave are some of the things that are taking place as we speak. That concludes my report. Thank you. Um, Mr. Elters, does the county keep track? Do, are there exit interviews and the, the reasons behind people leaving? Is there some kind of study that, that is maintained by the county? Um, 
Madam Chairman and board members, we absolutely do keep track. Uh, we take those, we, we obviously can't mandate it and force it, but many do fill out the surveys and uh, we track those. HR does, we have not done any studies, certainly not studies where we have paid for, but HR keeps track of them and I review them often. In fact, every request that comes in to fill a position after it's been vacated will have documentation and if, uh, if there is a exit, um, survey that was filled out, I would have a chance to see it, but HR tracks it as well. Is this something that the board can look at? Um, or is it private, like it, personnel and stuff? No, it, it's, it's not private. We can certainly summarize it. Um, um, we, we can certainly summarize it and tabulize it for you uh, and, and provide it to you. Uh, between now and the next board okay. meeting. <clears throat> well, maybe we'll, we'll put that on the agenda for another time. Thank you. Sure. Yes, Supervisor friends of Google. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, County Manager Elters, how many vacancies do we have? Um, we have right now between uh, general admin and the courts, we're running right around 90 to 95. It, it fluctuates. Uh, uh, Supervisor Gould, but it's been anywhere between 85 to 100 for the last several pay periods. It seemed like last year we were up above 100. We we had um, we had been well over 100. You're absolutely right. Uh, some of the measures that the board uh, approved in last year's budget have helped, but. What the vacancies is a measure of of the number of positions vacant uh, vacant during that pay period. We the board, in spite of the uh, the um, hiring freeze, continues to approve for us those key positions. But it's really a measurement of what vacancies we have. What this is reflecting is the positions people that are leaving and those positions that we keep sure. filling as as they become. Right. It just seemed like the number, when we were concerned with it last year, the number was quite a bit higher than the number that we have today. It, it is indeed, and um, it, but it's still higher than what we would like to have it. It's, it's an ongoing every pay sure. period, uh, so yes, it, is, it is, continues to be a challenge for us. Thank you, sir. You bet. Thank, Thank you. you, Chairman. Anyone else? Madam Chair, yes. one question for Ma Manager Elters. Um, is it the fact that we have 85 to 100 uh, vacancies or is it where those vacancies are located um, for instance the the technical registrants that you managed you mentioned it's um, we have this development process and we have to have technical registrants to review plans and things like that is that what you're talking about in those key areas uh, madam chairman supervisor uh, Lincoln Felter uh, yes indeed and uh, in fact we will be meeting with each board member this week uh, Luke and I to review our uh, budget uh, efforts and uh, um, status with you. We will be sharing information specific to each department and um, across the board, except for a few departments, we are in double digits as far as vacancies and, and uh, um, turnover. And that that is in law enforcement, the courts, uh, attorneys, both prosecution side and the defense as well, uh, public works, public health, development services across the board. Our challenge is, <clears throat> our challenge is attracting and filling these positions once they leave. And I will be able to show you in multiple departments where we're just not getting there. Okay, anybody else? <clears throat> okay, hearing, <clears throat> hearing them, we're gonna move on. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to move the consent agenda before the call to public. Many people have signed up for an item on consent. I've taken your sheets out of here and we'll call you up as we talk about it. It's, I think it's a better way we can answer questions and do things like that. So with that, um, is there anyone who wants to take anything else? Sure. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, number eight. 10 and 21. Okay, Supervisor Johnson. Nothing, Madam Chair. Supervisor Gould, uh, Lingenfelter. Item 16. 
16. Supervisor Bishop. It was going to be 16 as well. Okay. I need a motion to approve consent, uh, consent agenda items 5 through 32 minus 8, 10, 16, and 21. So move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item number 8. Approve the issuance of a notice of assessment in the amount of $27,826.89 against parcel number 31908-452A. Have somebody signed up. Chuck DeShazer. 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 Hello, I'm Chuck DeShazer, 8778 Polaris Road, Topak, Arizona. I ask that this item be pulled out because uh, what I'm seeing in the background material here is that there are nine inspections being charged $65 per inspection, and that, that just seems totally out of line. So if uh, possible, I'd like to have Tim Walsh explain why they have to do nine inspections for a single abatement, not to mention this particular abatement went illegally to the building code advisory board and charged a fee three months before my abatement was even started and mine a year a year later from from mine being approved by this board so you know they need to get their stuff together over there which i've said many times before that uh i'm just questioning the the charges and you know how they're how they're getting away with nine inspections on this issue okay anyone else it's all that signed up supervisor Gould. thank you madam chairman yeah i would like to have uh director walsh explain that please okay good morning chairman angus board of supervisors um this item it is a, a larger ticket item, and there were a number of inspections on this item. Um, reason being, and let me see, I'll pull this up just to give a little bit of context. Let's see if I can share this. There we go. So this is a structure out in Dolan Springs. Um, we were initial, initially received a complaint on this back in 2022, or beginning of 2022, it was February. Um, we went out, inspected it, um, verified that there was an issue there, that this was a dangerous structure. We identified it as a dangerous structure. Um, it, it was a large structure with quite a bit of uh, stuff <laughs> inside the structure so um we notified the applicant they appealed the case um it went as was prescribed in the ordinance and in our uh operating procedures it went before the plant uh, the building code advisory board they upheld the decision actually had two of the uh I think at least two of the uh, building code advisory board members went out on their own time to look at the structure and, and said, absolutely, that's a dangerous structure. Um, with that, we, following the, the, uh, uh, the building code advisory board upholding the, the decision, <clears throat> we did work with the owner, um, worked with them for quite some time, and they they were able to remove some of the the materials some of the the items that they had in there one they had some items that they saw as as, as having value they also um you know by, by them removing some of the items they were able to, to decrease the the cost to abate it um however after some time um they 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 uh they stopped speaking with us we um, reached out to them a number of times, got no response. Um, so then after uh, not hearing from them, we, we moved forward with the abatement and and here's your, your after pictures. Um, but the, the reason for the number of, of uh, inspections is just that, is, is working with the applicant, the number of times that we had to go out there, um, help them identify what needed to be done, what, what had to be uh, removed, what could, you know, how to go about removing it and those types of things. We, we were out there quite a bit on this project. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Director Walsh. 
No further question. Okay. Anyone else? Hey, what's your pleasure? Uh, motion to approve. Second. Motion is second. Any further discussion? Hear, hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Number 10, this is to approve the issuance of an assessment in the amount of 11523 and 23 cents against partial number 324-22190A. Similar. Yes, Mr. DeShazer. Yep, Chuck DeShazer again, Topak, Arizona. On this particular issue, a couple of uh, meetings ago or last meeting, the board uh, set up a new fee schedule and it's not been adjusted on this item. They're still charging $50 an hour instead of 35 that was approved by the board, but equally they've never had an approved uh, fee schedule for the building department. You guys only approved it last time for the uh, zoning department under 2020-7 uh, and not 2021-3, uh, I guess. Uh, so I would ask that they make whatever adjustments and if you look at the background material on this, it's a combined between the uh, the building department and the uh, zoning department, both putting in their inputs, they charge 1.75 hours at $35 an hour for an inspection, and the building department is charging $65 an inspection, times I believe it's four inspections on this, I don't have it right in front of me, and they're charging $50 an hour instead of $35 an hour for administrative time which, you know, even at $35 an hour, I've told you guys is $73,000 a year in salary, which is more than any of you supervisors are currently making. So I, I would hope that you get that adjusted out and explain, you know, what's going on over there at Development Services because they seem to mess everything up. Thank you very much. No one else has signed up to speak on this. Madam Chairman? Yes. Um, I'd like to have Director Walsh address that issue. <clears throat> Mr. Walsh? Issue. Chairman Angus, uh, Supervisor Gould, thank you. Pulling up the, let's see, I'll pull it up here. Um, at the time, so some of these we've been working on for, for a little bit of time, and um, I believe at the time that this was sent to the over to the attorney's office, we were still under the fifty dollars an hour. Um, but we'd be happy to revise that to the thirty-five dollars an hour. I, I apologize, I missed that as far as the office administration. Um, to Mr. DeShazer's point, uh, we did the, the board did adopt the uh, fees for uh, the zoning abatements. Um, we are bringing back the, the we're, there, there were still some changes to be made for the dangerous building abatement. So that one, I believe, is coming back at, at the next meeting. So that'll change those fees and how those are, um, how those are billed. But um, we, I, I know we did at the time, it was still the 50 when this was sent over to the attorney's office, but we can adjust that um, to get it down to the $35 an hour as, as we charge for the um, the zoning inspection, uh, the zoning uh, clerical time as well. So um, I'd be happy to make that change. And I can, if you give me a second, I can get my calculator out and see what the difference is between that. Questions? Supervisor Bishop? I will make a motion. Second. Motion second. Any further discussion? Is resolicitation with Serenity Memorial Group, Mojave Valley, renewing the contract for two additional years from December 1st, 2024 through November 30th, 2026, adding certification pursuant to ARS 35-394 and clarifying the medical examiner's office address with all other terms and conditions remaining the same on behalf of the Department of Public Health. There are people signed up and I'd like to hear from Public Health. Madam Chair? Yes. 
If I may, I'd like to make a motion to move into executive session to receive information from the county attorney and the sheriff's department. Okay. Second. Okay. We have a motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Let's go.
I'm just going to wait for Supervisor Gould to get back. Warren, item 16, this is about the medical examiner's contract. I'm going to call Dr. Kingsley from Public Health up to explain all of this to us. Thank you, Madam Chair and Board. Good morning. Um, as the contract administrator for this contract with the county, um, I can provide basically an executive summary of to date of, of performance, if that would be appropriate. Um, so for the medical examiner, um, reporting as contract administrator, medical examiner meets monthly, uh, meet, meets monthly data and finance reporting promptly and accurately. They promptly respond to inquiries when contacted. To date, there have been an approximately less than five external inquiries that were answered and resolved. Um, there have been no uh, official or uh, complaints filed with my department uh, with the medical examiner. Monthly cost is consistent in less than, uh, in less than similar counties. Uh, we looked at Yavapai, Yuma, Coconino, and Navajo, and those uh, that were able to provide information for comparison of costs. Uh, since January 2023, all ME internal data specific to each funeral home has been made available upon request. Uh, the data that was requested and sent with encryption uh, was uh, not all accessed, but is available at any time when requested. Um, for benefits delivered to the county over during the course of this contract, uh, uniform delivery of services consistent to other counties, reliable infrastructure um, from cars to staffing, Retention of the forensic pathologist, Dr. Mosley, which provides a reliable forensic pathologist for the for for those services re in, internally as well as through our court system. Uh, efficient use of locum forensic pathologists, uh, primarily from Pinal and, and Maricopa counties, and they are fully staffed with investigators. Many of those investigators have seven or more years experience uh, vehicles as well as infrastructure as well as the building as well as cooling stations that set up throughout the county that would help um, have more of a reliable system of being able to manage any dissidents. Uh, for updates to the contract, Serenity Medical Group sold its holdings to funeral homes in March 2023. As of April 2023, those contracts have been, uh, the, those contracts are carried uh, by those who purchased those, uh, purchased those. So Serenity, Serenity Moretta Memorial Group no longer has any holdings with any funeral homes within our county. Um, and, uh, and I can, um, at this point, I would say that the contract has been fulfilled, has been exemplary in the process. Mr. Hassett and Serenity Mural Group has uh, been uh, excellent partners to the county. Uh, we initially, this uh, contract was awarded in November 2021 with services begins, be, beginning December 1st, 2021. We were within uh, two years uh, into that contract, um, with the third, with expiration coming up this November 2024. Uh, due to circumstances within our county of uh, proceeding forward without the morgue, this process was reviewed and found that in the best interest of keeping that infrastructure and where the reliability of, of what the services we have, we'd be able to maintain consistent services for for uh, the members of our county um, with that so this contract was for three years with the option of two renewals and so we have uh, after investigating and looking through that process working with procurement who can uh, uh, set out the financials for you on uh, and the cost savings that are being offered uh, through this process uh, we've elected to continue forward to renew those next two years and there's a basic summary to provide for you Okay. Any questions for Mr. Dr. Kingsley? 
No? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We do have people signed up to speak. First up is, well, you know what? Before I do that, Dr. Kingsley, can, can you come up here? Um, so as, as far as your, your department mm -hmm. is concerned, everything that's being done is done according to the law? Yes. Okay, thank you. I believe they're just saying in that statement that uh, through ARS, a forensic pathologist is not, it's a may and not a shall uh, difference in the law. And so uh, there's, it's not a shall that a forensic pathologist would have to be in that any of the actual autopsies or any of the medical procedures, yes, needs to be a licensed forensic uh, pathologist or a licensed forensic pathologist. But for actually running it, the contract, no, there's not a, in, okay. it is not a shall, it's a, it's a may. I think this question would go to our attorney. Um, so uh, when it, in the statute, when it says the county may appoint, do, do, do you interpret that as, as if um, there is an in-house um, medical examiner department that it is the board's responsibility to appoint that forensic pathologist? Uh, Chairman, really the focus that we have is that, that the services that are being provided that are, that are laid out by statute is that there's a number of different duties that the medical examiner would have that those are done by a licensed pathologist and that's the focus that we're, that we're doing it on. As long as it's being done by a licensed pathologist, that's the key. Um, you know, the, the contract that we currently have is with, with somebody that is not a licensed pathologist, it's an entity. Um, but the services that are being provided are by one, so therefore it's meeting the terms of the statute. So that's, that's how we interpret it. The holder of the contract, the holder of the contract is basically just um, is the administrator of the contract. Correct. 100%. So the county doesn't really have much involvement except for the oversight, things like that. Yeah, the contractual oversight that we have. And if you look at the, the statute on medical examiner, there's a, a number of different responsibilities that a medical medical examiner has and that's where you need to make sure that we have that it's a that's a pathologist that, that yeah. is doing that and the it looks like from what we've been told that's what's been happening here right okay thank you and to confirm for comparison so Yavapai County and similar they had a forensic pathologist that retired uh, 14 months ago they haven't been able to fill that so they are contractually meeting those, those needs, but all those forensic pathologist cases are sent to Pinal County. Um, if needed, we can bring in Dr. Mosley as well as Dr. Hu from Pinal to provide any type of testimony or the forensic pathologist from Maricopa, Mar Maricopa to provide evidence on any of those points. So. To your knowledge, was there ever a situation where they could not have a forensic pathologist and it, it um, took time and... Uh, was it, was it ever a problem, is my point. Uh, there is no problem on issue. I think all counties are dealing with that on being able to deliver services. And so we have one forensic pathologist, for, uh, mostly. Um, it will only increase if we don't have a forensic pathologist. So receiving those patients, we would have to send them, drive them down to Pinnell. For example, at pause, they have to send all their cases. They don't have a morgue or a forensic pathologist or a contractor with anyone to deliver services. And so they have to contract with the funeral homes to transport the bodies. They have to pay per diem for those bodies to be transported to Pinal, pay the hotel food of the, those, those transporting for that process and it's not done the next day. It just depends, it gets put into the schedule. Once it's done, then it's brought back um, on those points. Can I say there at time there is uh, administrative delays? Yes, there is, but there's just things you can't, there's just that normal process, but it is done as promptly and quickly as possible. That what I can say, that they have provided services as soon as possible, that is capable. So, yes. Because the county doesn't have a morgue, an on-site morgue, this, these problems, I remember since the beginning, maybe Supervisor Johnson can remember too, that there was always stuff because that's just the nature of it, yeah. right? And then for if you have any direct questions too on any of these points, Mr. Hassett is here to provide that and as well as the contractual side of it, so thank okay, you. Okay, thank you very much. First up, uh, Ms. Jennifer Esposito.
Thank you, Chairman Angus. Um, yes, Jennifer Esposito, candidate for District 4 County Supervisor. Uh, this has been kind of a um, contentious issue for some time. I think that the public would be best served by putting out a request for qualifications. It's not for me so much whether or not we're following the letter of the law. Uh, it, it's really more about whether it, it appears that there may or may not be a conflict of interest. Everything this board does should have the appearance of, of being equal treatment under the law, equal, you know, if you have one uh, business who's also administering uh, uh, something with the county, m even the appearance that they might not be um, sending deceased persons to uh, their own business or other people's businesses or whatever, even the appearance of impropriety is unacceptable. And if you have, I, I, and I do believe that you do have other people who are interested in applying for the position, then it's there's really no harm in putting out an RFQ and deciding whether or not uh, business as usual is the best business to conduct or whether or not Mojave County can do better. And that's all I'd like to say. Thank you. Mr. Esposito. Thank you. Uh, welcome back, Buster. I'm, I'm glad you recuperated. <clears throat> All right. Serenity More and More the Group's president and director, John Hassett, has been rumored to have contributed to Hildy's Senate campaign. If true, me thinks she should recuse herself. The concern that should be noted and dealt with is that there is no evidence that the health director has even looked for another provider. This would be his job on my planet. Does the county make it a habit to renew contracts without changes or searching the market for qualified persons or entities? Oh, we must remember that this board is certainly lazy. Example being the illustrious county manager's contract, which is totally bloated. Uh, you seem to bend to the whims of all of your unelected, self-interested department heads. We pay you to oversee county business, and we pay you well. Do your jobs. Control these departments. Table this. Create a time period to research other providers with a licensed forensic pathologist. Wilma, you are using your position to interfere as in an election by arranging private meetings for select candidates. Example is the meeting held one week prior to a public meeting in Meadview with the Lake Mead Parks representative. You invited your cousin, Don Martin, Gilbert Smaby. There are many other candidates. Yeah, um, excuse me, can we keep on? Form, please, Mr. Esposito, please cut his and mic. Travis, you please seem to be Please cut his mic your constituents on your Facebook Please account, cut his mic. Mr. Esposito, you are not in order. Please sit down. Sit down. Sit down. We are, we are, all right, now that you've brought it up, I called you Mr. Esposito because things here have become kind of a circus. So for the future, I will refer to you as your it, with your uh, title and your surname, and you will do the same for us. I'm Supervisor Angus, Supervisor Johnson, Supervisor Lingenfelt, or Supervisor Bishop, Supervisor Gould. We are, you're here to address the board, and that is how we're going to proceed from here on. Next up, Naomi Bradbury Marshard. Or, I, sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. Board of Supervisors, once again, we're here. Um, I, I don't like having to be here, but I would like to set one thing straight for one of your regular talkers. We are not here fighting over bodies. We are here about ethics and compassion to the families. <clears throat> they depend on us as for funeral professionals to provide care and healing. When there is a death, these families 
Many of them are traumatized, especially if it's a sudden death and they have to go to the medical examiner's office. Then they're re-traumatized because they are required to wait for the medical examiner's office to take care of things. We have somebody right now in the, in the medical examiner's office, and they did tell me that I had permission to use them. The death occurred on March 10th. Today is the 18th. This person has an 11-year-old son who wants to see his mother and say goodbye. He is not able to do that because we do not have an on-site medical examiner. I know that every one of you are aware that there is a doctor of pathology in the Kingman community that wants this contract, who is able to do autopsies and exams on a daily basis and has several other pathologists to help them. This is not about competition or anything else. Right now, this is about families. When you have to sit across the table from these families and try and explain to them why it's taking up to 11 days to have their loved one released, there is no excuse for it. And then we as funeral professionals get those people back and we're supposed to try and make them look good after they spent that many days in a body bag? These families deserve better. They are not getting $1.1 million in services. That is their taxpayer dollars, $1.1 million a year for this kind of service. So I would ask that you would put this back out for bid because there are well-qualified people who are willing to do the job every day and families do not have to wait. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Daniel Sudolovsky, doctor. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Daniel Sudolovsky. I'm a pathologist here in Kingman, a uh, relative newcomer to the county. Prior to this, I was the medical examiner for Tompkins County, New York for 12 years, a program which I essentially launched from zero. Uh, and we approached the county manager's office over a year ago, uh, expressing interest in uh, bidding for this contract. Uh, we expressed our willingness to work through a variety of different models, be it a model similar to what we have now where we would employ uh, the, the uh, death scene investigators and morgue attendants, etc., or some sort of joint venture where the county would have more control of those employees and therefore more transparency in the contract. Uh, we again approached them uh, late last year, uh, year uh, November, December, again expressing our desire to bid for this contract. Um, we believe that we can provide a dramatic improvement in service to the community and uh, uh, the you know, families of, of the deceased. Um, in my experience, uh, turnaround for a complete autopsy with death certificate should be no more than 48 hours. Um, I don't remember in the thousands of autopsies that I've performed uh, ever having one go much longer than that, unless there was extensive forensic uh, examination that needed to be done. But the vast majority of bodies can be turned over within 48 hours to their families and, and to funeral homes. Um, the contract as it exists is highly irregular uh, from my experience. I've never heard of um, the mortuary industry commingling with the medical examiner's office. By definition, there's conflict of interest. Uh, we think that we can provide a far more transparent approach to this uh, and solve a lot of controversy in the county and maybe some headaches for you as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Ryan Swap. For the supervisors, Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Ryan Swap. I've 
been a pathologist in the community here in Kingman for 11 years. Um, our group is called Monolith Diagnostics um, with Dr. Sudolovsky and uh, my other partner, Dr. Brent Bedke. Um, we do pathology work at ORMC, at KRMC, and also um, Yuma Regional Medical Center, where we also perform uh, the medical examiner services in Yuma County for the last five years. Uh, so we have extensive experience doing this. Um, we were fortunate uh, that Dr. Sudolovsky joined us a few years ago. Um, you know, we've thought about uh, approaching the county for many years regarding the medical examiner services, but the timelines for us and for them just never seemed to sync up. Whenever there was an RFP that was out there, uh, it seemed like we were taking on a major project, maybe a new contract at another hospital, um, or we just didn't, weren't appropriately staffed. We, you know, we know how hard it is to also staff. We're fortunate now to have six pathologists uh, among these three hospitals, and we're slightly overstaffed. We feel like we finally, for the first time ever, have some bandwidth um, where we could uh, take on a, a job like this. Um, I trained at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, my partner, Brent Bedke, trained with me there. Dr. Sudolowski trained at UCSF. Um, these are, you know, very good institutions. We're well-trained. We, we do this job, and we do it well. Um, and we would simply like the opportunity um, to present a proposal. I'm not saying that we're the best option, but we would like to at least be given the opportunity to be evaluated. Um, where I trained, uh, there's a saying, a motto, that, and that is that the needs of the patient come first. And that was ingrained in us over and over and over. And um, it didn't matter really, you know, whether it was convenient for the patient, I mean, for the physician or for the staff or whatever. The needs of the patient came first, and that's something that I've carried with me. Um, in my practice, and that's something that we try to exemplify in our practice. And um, I think that the needs of the patients, the decedents, their families, and also the taxpayers would be well served to at least have a request for proposals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. James Jones. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. I'm James Jones of Kingman, Arizona, local sovereign. You guys really stepped into it, didn't you? A real problem. No, there's nothing against all of you. I've been watching this situation since 2009, so I, I, I kind of have a lot of empathy for where you're at with all of this. So what I'm about to say, don't take it personal, because I had a personal experience that um, I've kept quiet about because my father was involved. He was murdered here in Kingman, and um, I tried to get him for, uh, some help, and I tried to stop it all. But when it came down to me talking to the, at that time, a, uh, a woman from Las Vegas that was contracted with the county, and this has nothing to do with you all, but this, this problem has gone on and on and on with the, the medical uh, uh, examiner's uh, position here. I couldn't get anything done. I couldn't prove anything that my, my father was murdered. I was just thrown, you know, just pushed aside, and it was, it was told to me there's nothing that can be done. Well, I have the evidence that he was murdered. And I have been heartbroken, and I never took it to court. But one thing that stuck, sticks in my mind was the organization of what's going on and the lack of attention to what's going on has been kicked the can kind of syndrome all the way down to where you guys fall into a big problem. I mean, I, I see what's, what's going on for the first time with, with politics here in, in this county. It's, it's really hard to, to step into somebody that has been flagrant in their duties bef before you and step in and try and fix it. I think what has just been pre presented to the board should be taken into very, very uh, important in consideration. 
there's no more of a of, of a uh, uh, important uh, problem right now that I think the board has other than one day one vote but that's another story okay <laughs> but right now the medical examinations and the department needs needs some direction and I know that's a hard situation but I think we have two volunteers that just stepped up here that may be able to help and I would suggest to the board that everything be put on hold until you can find out a little bit more about these people and do something maybe with them and bring everybody together in one big group to be able to f push forward what's really uh, what is needed. It's not let's let's accuse this person or that accuse them. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Jones, and I, I'm sorry for your loss. Would you mind telling me what year that was that you had this issue with your father? Two thousand and nine. And nine. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, sorry for your loss. All right, that is all that's signed up. Um, does um, Mr. Hassett, who currently holds the contract, would you like to speak? Madam Chair, Supervisors, thank you for allowing me to take the time to visit with you today. I just want to go on a couple of clarity things for Mrs. Esposito and Dr. Sudolovsky. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And I want to reiterate the fact that Dr. Kingsley had stated that the funeral home holdings were sold in actually October of 2022. There is no commingling or any kind of um, oh, conflict of interest, if, if you will. I just want clarification on the record for that. Um, as we all know, the county will be going out for RFP at the end of the five year. That's where the three years with two one year extensions came in. Um, the re renewal that we're here today to discuss or consider is predicated on the fact that my contract is coming up for renewal and I stand by exactly what I said in the very beginning when I met with all of you. I am not a forensic pathologist, nor am I a pathologist, nor am I a, a medical doctor. I'm a business person. I was approached by Dr. Mosley who had been doing this for many, many years and there was a problem that had um, arose and we put together a model to try to fix that and try to help the county. I've stated to both my contract administrators that I am more than willing and would be honored to assist the county in transitioning their contract to do it in-house. I know it's not ideal right now based on funding, but there will come a time when this is going to happen. And um, I, I don't mean to sound arrogant in any way, shape, or form, but out of all the people that have spoke today, I'm the longest standing individual here in the funeral and uh, pathology-based industry here in the county, and I've seen everything from our little building out on North Stockton Hill Road that is now a church to what we have today. So I've seen it evolve and I'm more than happy to have the county transition it under their um, uh, it, direct supervision through a government entity and I'm, I'm happy to extend that uh, assistance when that time comes. Um, if any supervisor would like to discuss the case that Naomi Bradbury referenced, I have all the information in front of me as well. Um, so if there is further information that needs to be asked about that, we can. I, I'm open to any kind of questions, comments, concerns. I'm here to really serve the county and, and fill a void that is, is not only our county, but many counties um, throughout Arizona. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, any questions for Mr. Hassett? Oh, I'm sorry, may I add something, Madam Chair? Please. Um, I don't mean to stand before anyone and discredit anyone's professional capabilities or anything in that way, shape, or form, but I had a meeting with Dr. Swap and reached out to him and was extremely transparent, giving him all of our information, knowing full well that he contracts his services to other entities, also knowing full well that he had approached the county. And I had every intention of, I even pitched any kind of joint venture or opportunity that we could better serve, whether it be moving the morgue to the Kingman area, um, subcontracting with his pathologist. I know that he, he has stated that he had a meeting with the county, whom I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but he had a meeting that he would follow up with me. Um, none of that has been said, but that offer was presented to Dr. Swap. I only met with him, not Dr. Sudolovsky or any of the other team members, but that offer was presented to him on, on what I thought at the time to be a very beneficial meeting to our organization, but apparently I was proven wrong by that. So if you have any questions or concerns, I'm happy to help. Yes, Supervisor Gould. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Hasslett, I'd like to hear your rebuttal to Mr. Uh, Madam Bradbury's accusation. Yes, Supervisor. Um, Madam Chair, Supervisor Gould. Um, I was just 
I, I don't have any names, obviously, and I, I wouldn't feel comfortable releasing that. But if, in fact, that it is, she has the name, so if we wanted to talk and verify after the meeting, I'm happy to do so. But if it is the individual that uh, my office is referencing, it wasn't until Saturday night that they had chose that funeral home. Um, up until that time, there was no release filed. We require a DocuSign release before we can um, release to any funeral home of their choice before they end up going to the rotation funeral homes. And it was a case that was pushed to the next week's pathologist based on multiple homicides and multiple posts that were performed by um, Dr. Hu. So again, I have additional information that regards to names and current ongoing cases that I'd be more than happy to address with you if you'd like me to come to your office or something like that. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, sir. Anyone else? Supervisor Johnson, nothing? No. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, I pulled this item. For those that have been following this, if you remember three years ago, um, this contract has always been really difficult for Mojave County. And the county put out a couple of RFPs without any, any providers willing to step up. Um, and so... I want to credit staff for coming up with a really um, innovative model for service delivery. And I also want to thank the current provider who, no matter what happens today with the, with the vote, um, is the provider for the initial three-year term, which expires, I believe, December 1st of 2024. Uh, that being said, I do think that um, Mojave County as a board, we owe the citizens of Mojave County these services, which are sensitive services, uh, the best available services at the best available price. And three years ago, we didn't have any competition. Um, but um, we live in the United States and, and the free market, and I think we do have at least two providers. There may be more um, if the county puts out a professional request for proposals. But I think that we owe it to the citizens of Mojave County to put out a request for proposals. Um, and the way that that's written, um, we could hopefully staff can, can take all of the things that have been learned over the last three years um, when they would refresh the scope of services for that RFP. Um, also, the selection criteria, those of you that are familiar with our request for proposals process, there are a number of weighted criteria. One of the major weighted criteria in an RFP process is something called method of approach. And under method of approach, I would, I would assume that the county would ask any interested providers, how do you intend to handle investigators or other staff in addition to pathology services? How would you handle morgue requirements and, and everything that goes into these services? Um, I would hope that if the county did, if our board did vote to resolicit these services, that that would be open to everybody, uh, including our current provider for the last three years um, and any new providers. And then it's really up to them to put their best, best business case forward and their best pricing forward um, to continue providing these services past December 1st of 2024. So I'm going to be supportive of actually resoliciting this. Um, and either the current provider will end up with it or we'll end up with a new provider, but hopefully we'll end up with at least the same level of service and professionalism or better, the same pricing that we have right now or better. Um, I think competition is, is good. Um, it always brings out the best in, in people and in professions. So that's what I'm going to be recommending today. Is, you want to make that in the form of a motion? Yes, I, I, would, I would make a motion that staff resolicit the services um, and, and not renew the current contract. Second. I have a motion this session. Any further discussion? Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, Supervisor Langenfelter, would you be willing to put a time limit on that? Um, I understand on a regular request for proposal, we take months to get it done. But it's my understanding that both groups have met with the county manager. They've had time to <coughs> put together their plans. I don't think there's any need for uh, dragging this out. So I would say 
you know, if there's somebody else on the outside that wants to come in, we realize there's not going to be anybody. We have two entities, so we give them 30 days to get their proposals in so we can get this done because we do have a budget coming up. Madam Chair. Yes. Supervisor Johnson, I, I'd like to have just one additional discussion point with our county manager, Elters, and also our procurement director. I know that the typical request for proposals process is um, about 120 days uh, when you factor in all the publication requirements and the negotiations and everything that goes into that process. Um, so I'm definitely willing to put in a timeline. I, I would just um, want to get staff, professional staff's opinion on what that timeline should be. Yeah, thank you, Chairman and Supervisor Linkfelter. <clears throat> um, 30 days would be the amount of time from when we defined the scope, defined the criteria, and issued the solicitation. They'd have about 30 days to respond. That is statutory. Um, and our timeline from the point that we define scope, define criteria, to the point of making an award recommendation to the board tends to be 120 days on simple RFPs. If we're going to in some way go back to the drawing board and make sure that we've got a fair competitive process and we update our scoring criteria. To your point, we've met with the county manager's office. We understand the intent, but there is time to get a good solicitation out. I think we'd be looking 120 to 150 days from now to the point that we'd be in a position to make an award recommendation to the board. Part of that is going through the evaluation committee meetings. Part of that is negotiating with whoever the successful offer may be and then going from the point of when my staff is ready to make the recommendation through the agenda process for the board to see it. Madam Chair. Yes. Um, I believe under our, my current motion, these professional services are covered under our current contract through December 1st, 2024. Um, in respect to staff, um, I don't want to place any uh, additional pressure on, on you folks than we really need to. So I, I guess I would just ask that, obviously, you know that, that um, you have to have a you would have to have a new contract in place before December first, twenty twenty four. So um, I, I'm not sure I'm going to put a timeline of thirty days. I don't think that's going to be workable. If it's if the if pleasure. I, if of I, if the I board. understood it right, if it's the pleasure of the board or the county manager, we could come back with a planned timeline potentially at a future meeting. That here's when we think we'll be ready to publish, and based on that and scheduling with committee members, so that we have a better idea of when we think we'd be ready to award. My other concern in this is, although the contract expires in December, if our incumbent receives it, we don't need to worry about transition. One of the difficult things in transitioning from Dr. Mosley running it to um, John Hassett running it was that transition of services. One of the other concerns that I would have is we do not have a county-owned morgue facility, and currently um, John Hassett is leasing the building if we were to change a ward those are all of those things that we'd need to work through is where do we start operating out of madam chair yes uh, tara uh, are those questions that would be um perhaps posed under the selection criteria when they're going to talk about their method of approach how do you how are you going to provide these professional services where are you going to provide these professional services how is this going to flow all those things that i mean obviously as one party to the contract, the county has to know these things. Yes, absolutely. And so conceptually, it would be in their proposal, but then it becomes the board awards a contract. How much time do we need to transition services from Hassett and Dr. Mosley and anyone that they have as the locum um, pathologist providing the service to a new service provider, if that's the case? Okay. So just realizing that there needs to be some overlap time. Once an award is made, you can put a lot of things on paper that sometimes in practice go a little bit awry, and I don't want to put pressure on that as well. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, if I may ask uh, Supervisor Gould to lift his second, I'd like to restate my motion to resolicit these services, but also to request the county manager's office um, in a future county manager's report to um, share the schedule, the, the, the procurement schedule for these services with the Board of Supervisors. I'll lift my second. Thank you. And I would make that a motion. Okay. We have a motion. Second. Can I that, just clarify real quick? That, does that still also include not to renew the current contract? Yes. Correct. We still said the services do not renew the contract, which goes through December 1st of 2024. And during a, a future county manager's report, uh, update the County Board of Supervisors on the procurement schedule. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes. I would like to also uh, remind the board as you, I'm glad no timeline was placed, but we do understand the contract expires at a certain time toward the end of the year. Um, I just wish to remind the board that procurement is a small department 
currently has vacancies that we're trying to fill, and the ARPA projects that I reported to you on earlier, they touch every, just about every single project that goes out. So this is a department that is stretched out and overwhelmed, and we will do, I will ensure that they do their best to meet this um, timeline, uh, but it will not be without its own challenges. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion, we have a second, and I would like to say something. Um, first of all, I've taken no money from Mr. Hassett for my campaign, that's number one. Number two, I do wanna thank Mr. Hassett. If everybody remembers, this county was in a world of hurt when Dr. Mosley decided that he didn't want it. It was the last minute, and uh, only one uh, agency, one company, one person stood up, and that was John Hassett, and he saved us and has been doing a good job. It is an unusual contract, but I think for what it is and how it's been written, uh, he's done a very, very good job. So I, I just wanted to put that on the record before we vote. Madam Chair? Yes. I'd just like to say I, I would second that sentiment. <clears throat> okay. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. All right. We're on to item 21, still on the consent agenda. Approve the transfer. Is that the one we're doing? 21 or is it 20? 21. Yeah, 21. 21. Okay. Approved transfer of highway advisory radio system that broadcasts real-time travel-related information through lower power AM radio transmission from Public Works, Traffic Control Division to the Golden Valley County Improvement District Number 1. Who took this off? It was my very okay. school. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I would just like uh, Director Latoski to give us an overview of what he's got planned here. Yes, uh, Supervisor Gould, uh, uh, Chairman Angus and Supervisor Gould, good morning. Uh, this uh, entails uh, transferring the highway advisory radio uh, that is currently installed adjacent to Long Pine Mountain Road um, to the Golden Valley Improvement District. A highway advisory radio basically provides a low-powered radio transmission of real-time updates. Uh, that is currently being accomplished by a text-based changeable message sign on Walpi Mountain Road. And the reason for this move is twofold. One, on Walpi Mountain Road, um, we find that the changeable message sign is more effective to post real-time traffic condition uh, updates, namely during inclement weather events. And two, we have had issues in the past with communicating by telephone to remote program voice messages on the highway advisory radio. And again, this is namely during inclement weather events on the mountain. So we see an interesting opportunity to shift this device to the Golden Valley Improvement District, which would allow us to provide real-time updates uh, should we have uh, an event of a water outage occur. Um, we think that this is a uh, an opportunity whereby customers of Golden Valley Improvement District could simply tune to an AM radio station. It's actually 1610. And if there were an event that is uh, taking place or if they're suspecting that perhaps there is an outage, uh, that the radio transmission you know, would be an interesting and, and effective outlet uh, to convey that uh, outage information. Uh, staff um, sees a, a greater, much, much greater reliability to be able to either dial in or just program directly uh, the highway advisory radio if it was positioned, say, at our uh, Golden Valley Improvement uh, uh, Field Office uh, on Laguna and uh, Chino. Interesting. Thank you, Director. Okay. Any further questions? Supervisor Gould. Motion to approve. Second. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, um, I'm just gonna go, we have one public hearing before I go back to the call to public. Item 33 has been pulled, it's been withdrawn, so it's only item 34. So I'm gonna open the public hearing for item 34, discussion and possible action, recommend approval of the bingo license application received by TY, TY Washington Foundation, and direct the clerk of the board to follow the application to the Arizona Department of Revenue pursuant to ARS 5-409 and 5-410. There is nobody as like, oh, one person signed up to speak. I believe it's the applicant. 
Oh, actually, two people. Um, let's start with the applicant, Jennifer Jones. You want to come up together? You're Devin? Okay. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see all your faces. It's been a while. <laughs> so um, we are here for, we were previously here before under um, LCRO, Local Charity Relief Organization. And we did get denied because of us not being a nonprofit in Arizona for more than two years. We were misinformed, excuse me, misinformed by the state when we first applied. So we went through the whole process. You guys approved us to go on, and then the state came back to us um, saying you guys weren't established for two years in Arizona. So we did find um, a charity to work with, and um, we were kind of advised to look for somebody else. And um, this is who we found, and they're ready and willing to work with this community now as well. Any questions? I'm sorry. I'm this sorry. is a public hearing. If there are questions, we'll call you back. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there anyone else who wants to speak to item 34? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Gould. Chairman, if I can get the applicants to come back down, sorry. Almost made it. Close, but not quite. <laughs> been so long since we've seen you. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about this charity and what they, the kind of work that they do? So the charity, we, we deal with youth football, youth basketball, youth sports. Um, we provide, we know that the services for the kids is always a struggle to get uniforms. Some kids can't pay, things like that. So that's always been our main focus. Um, but we do our best to help raise money for the high school kids, the youth kids, just to kind of alleviate the problem for some of the parents. Um, that's our biggest process there. So I noticed that this charity is not local to our county. Correct. We would be the ones that are going to bring that charity here to the county, and then we're going to continue to work with them while we start our own here locally. Okay. We just have to start the two-year process. So we wanted, we've kind of went all in on this. We were approved. We were told from the state early on that no, it'll be no problem. You guys come on over. So we shut down shop where we were at. We put everything here. We've been leasing a building for six months, thinking that everything was going to be smooth. And then as we get here, we start to find out, no, you have to have this, you have to have that, even though the state told us different via email. Okay. Uh, motion to approve. <clears throat> motion to approve. Do I get a second? Second. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you very, very much. Thank we you. Bingo. I can't, we can't wait to <laughs> get in this community and help so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. We're going to go back to the call to public pursuant to ARS 38-431. A public body may make an open call to the public during a public meeting subject to reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions to allow individuals to address the public body on any issues within the jurisdiction of the public body. We have thrown that out the window. Um, I'm, I'm going to say something that I, I wanted to say now. I kind of said it earlier because it was being used. Um, I think that we have lost some decorum uh, in, in this, this, uh, uh, this auditorium when it comes to public input. And I just want to put it back. You're here to talk to us as the Board of Supervisors. Not, we're not at a Saturday night cocktail party. And, and so I'm going to call you by your surnames and I, so I hope for the same courtesy in response. And that's what I wanted to say earlier. And I hope that four-letter words and profanities will not, be, will not be stated here. All right, first up, Don Martin. Good morning, Madam Chairman and Board. My name is Don Martin. I live here in Kingman. Got a couple of things to report. I, I know normally when people come up here, you hear a lot of criticism. But I want to report on some things that I think are very positive for our community in Mojave County. The first is about a project that just occurred up on South Cove in conjunction with the Lake Mead National Recreation Area. Supervisor Bishop was at one of the meetings there 
we coordinated with the uh, Park Service to provide a kayak launching facility or ramp there for the local kayaking community to to launch their boats not in conflict with the big boats and the Park Service was overwhelmingly supportive of doing what they could do to make that happen uh, last Saturday a group of volunteers went up there we cleaned the place up we made the uh, adjustments that needed to be made for the kayaking community so they are now have a, their own dedicated place for them to launch and recover without causing any kind of problem with the uh, other boat recreational users my second point concerns the uh, information about the mineral park solar project I have heard nothing about it publicly but I've delved into it and I found out that project is now officially dead the BLM for the first time in Arizona has denied a variance they did it at Mineral Park and the reason they did it is because of the work of not only this board but of all the citizens in our community that were adamantly opposed to that project now that's a win-win for our citizens and like I say it couldn't have been done without a collaborative effort and it's going to happen that's the great news here's the bad news BLM has approved the White Hills project and they're going great guns with that one and they fully intend to support RE energy up there to do how many thousands of acres that they're going to manipulate previously public lands that have been used for multiple use to single use that's another fight that's coming folks we're going to need your support of the Board of Supervisors to to fight that we don't want that in Mojave County we don't want to look like Clark County that's got miles of solar panels stretched up and down the highway so I just wanted to bring that to your attention I have not seen anything in the press about this and yet I feel personally it's one of the most important issues that we got facing Mojave County right now thank you thank you very much Mr. Durfee, Randy Durfee. Good morning, Madam Chair, Board. I have a document here. I'm here today to call out abuse and intimidation and abuse of power by the Board of Supervisors to the public. We are, that are performing at the expense of our county taxpayers. This can be perceived as criminal acts as abuse of power. As proof, this document, mid-February, a supervisor using county email letterhead sent a complaint to an organization about a social media post, Facebook, trying to have that person's credentials revoked. So I'm here today to call out Board of Supervisor Ms. Bishop. You did the letter because you were upset about a public post on a dog. You tried to influence the organization through your letter, your email, and county letterhead in your position on the board. This matter was denied by the organization as a personal matter, not a professional matter. I would ask that the board stop using their positions, emails, and county resources to go after insignificant people thank you thank you very much okay um, I have several people for the power plant I'm hoping uh, mr. Grinstead and then Don Matson will be the next up I think that's all there is Good morning, Madam Chair and Board of Supervisors. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning, almost the afternoon. Over the weekend, our organization, on behalf of our organization, notinanyneighborhood.org, sent a forward of an email from Patrick Ledger from Arizona uh, GNT. You should have received that by now. The process from the very beginning has been one that lacked total transparency from the very beginning 
We were promised updates. They didn't come. Once we made comments on social media, like magic, we had an update. 36 hours. So thank you for your comments, Chairman Angus. We appreciate that. We have to wonder, you know, you look at this, and it was an energy facility. Then it's two peaker units. Now there's a model for four peaker units. Did any of you even dream there would be four peaker units next to neighborhoods in Fort Mojave? <coughs> or did you know? There's the, the lack of transparency is just so wrong, and I know you guys can see it. Supervisor Angus, you said on social media, we granted MEC this process to work it out. I'm going to wait for the final information to come in, and the board will see how we want to go forward. Nothing is being built, and there are no shovels in the ground till the board is satisfied. You may... It may not be on your timeline, but the search for a new location is happening. Our timeline is if MEC and AG&T would tell us no site A, no site B, we're standing down. We will support them. But we're expected to just be quiet while there's no information provided. I think all of you know two units or four is very wrong in that neighborhood. We're not going to let up our efforts, our resolve, until not in any neighborhood is told that a natural gas-fired peaker plant will not be built on either site A or B. Our efforts are growing every week. There will be an article by the Arizona Republic out this week. There'll be an investigative report by The Guardian that will be coming up, along with Sierra Club and the Center for Biological Diversity. Please, relook at this. Thank you. Mr. Matson, and then Tyler Carlson is after him. In case I get thirsty. <laughs> Hello, Board of Supervisors. Uh, I want to talk about the original zoning of the uh, area in question at Site A. Um, I looked at the minutes from April 2nd of 2018. Uh, I was wondering why the Board of Supervisors would justify a heavy manufacturing facility so close to a residential area. And what did the supervisors at the time think could happen when they made the zoning change? So I have a bunch of notes from the uh, meeting minutes of April 2nd, 2018. Uh, in attendance, Chairman Gary Wilson, Supervisor District 1, Hilde Inga, Supervisor District 2, Buster Johnson, Supervisor District 3, Gene Bishop, Supervisor District 4, Lois Wakamoto, Supervisor District 5, Mike Hendricks. This was item 44. Uh, for Board of Supervisor Resolution 2018, number 41, and this was the reassessment of the residential area to MX Heavy Manufacturing. Jim Palmer was the uh, person requesting this change. He stated, and Forgive me if I jump through some of this. I just want to hit a few highlights here, but you can go look at the record and look at the rest of the context if you choose. Uh, Jim Parker stated as a brief comment to the board and to those that are concerned, we are concerned about being good neighbors. 
And Mr. Palmer stated that they have heavy machinery that is inside the building. It is soundproof so that none of their employees even have to wear sound protective equipment. So it certainly won't be a noise factor for the community. Supervisor Wakamoto stated, okay, there are no chemicals involved. Mr. Palmer responded, there is no hazardous or toxic chemicals whatsoever. So this is the original application 2018. Uh, Supervisor Johnson stated, I have a question for Mr. Walsh, if I may, stated the question I have and may, maybe I'm misunderstanding what it is, but there's a lot of talk about dirt roads. He stated, I understand when we build that they improve the property, they wet it down and all of that in the roads. He asked, are we allowing commercial operations to go out where they're without people having paved roads to them? Tim Walsh responded with road improvements will be addressed during the site plan. So this is a new question I have for you is, do you have any money to pave roads? Thank you very much. I'll give you the rest next meeting. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Tyler Carlson. After Mr. Carlson, it's Chris Rodarte. Madam Chair, Board of Supervisors, Tyler Carlson, Mob Electric Cooperative. I live in Bullhead City. Um, we are continuing to look at additional sites. Uh, we made that commitment early on, and we are. A couple of sites have not panned out. We've ex uh, expended significant resources, and it is resource intensive to actually look at other sites to make sure that they are usable. Uh, even doing preliminary, preliminary uh, analysis on air. It takes a significant amount of, amount of time. We are still looking. Uh, we've had some constructive input from uh, some of our members uh, on identifying a couple of other sites. Uh, a couple have not panned out, but we, we are, there are a couple that look very promising. And we have, um, we have some optimism about them. And we will continue on to put all of our efforts and most of our efforts into identifying and finding an alternative site. And we're still active in that. Um, please bear with us as you have to go through all of that analysis and study to figure it out. Uh, and there are other landowners or other folks around, whether it be BLM, uh, state land, that you have to get figured out from the standpoint of permitting as well. So we are looking at it, and, and I appreciate the patience that you've all had and the patience of the folks uh, that, are, that, are, uh, that are having problems with the existing location. So thank you very much. That's where we're at. Thank you. Ms. Rodarde. After Ms. Rodarde, Armin Stang. Chris Rodarde, Mojave County Taxpayer. Proverbs 19, verse 5 states, A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaks lies shall not escape. I am ashamed of Mojave County. Politics is an ugly business, and the personal defamation attacks this election season have only just begun. We brag and posture about being so red and conservative, supporting patriotic values and practicing biblical principles. Then the politicians we supposedly support savagely smear and desecrate their opponents. Nothing new here, of course. It's just so sad seeing it play out live and in person right in front of our eyes. Well-known English Bible commentator and pastor Matthew Henry once said, It is required of us that we be tender of the good name of our brethren. Where we cannot speak well, we had better say nothing than speak evil. We must not take pleasure in making known the faults of others divulging things that are secret merely to expose them, nor in making more of their known faults than really they deserve, and least of all in making false stories and spreading things concerning them of which they are altogether innocent. What is this but to raise the hatred and encourage the persecutions of the world against those who are engaged in the same interests with ourselves? 
and therefore with whom we ourselves must stand or fail. Wise words spoken centuries ago, even more relevant today. And Proverbs 19.9 spells out, A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaks lies shall perish. I believe this applies to all of us, politicians included. Thank you. Thank you very much, Armin Stang. And then Mr. Greg Beffer. Good morning, Madam Chair, Supervisors. I'm in Stange, Fort Mojave, a.k.a. the German. Here is our newest homeless camp coming up. They're building little sheds and everything. Looks great, doesn't it? It's right down the street from me. Not going to happen. And then we have motorhomes lit on fire so they don't have to dispose of the interior so they can strip them. Down the street from me, not going to happen. We have south of Patina, another camp coming up. It's right behind this place rental. Looks like a junkyard there too. Don't need that in my neighborhood. Here's two pages of property owners. What should be either sided or the property is taken away because they condole it. And then I have a problem. I see all this building going on. Where do we get the water from? I think we need to stop giving out building permits like candy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stang. Mr. Beffert. After Mr. Beffert, Mike Man Mangana, Manjana, I'm sorry. Supervisors, for the record, my name is Greg Beffert, I'm a Mojave County resident. Uh, at the last meeting, I uh, outlined four things the, that I had requested uh, from the county as a remedy for the complaint that I filed against Supervisor Angus for her comments towards me in, in January. Uh, I got a public apology, uh, which I, I, I don't accept uh, because it was insincere, and I'll explain why. Um, but beyond that, I'll also uh, come up and justify my, my recommendations for her resignation. Uh, so I, I told you a long time ago that as a police officer, uh, one of my abilities was to be able to detect deception, the truth from a lie. Uh, we did that a number of ways. One, a look at inconsistencies and in statements and contradictions between what people said and what they actually did. In addition to that, we looked at body language and behavioral clues. And I looked at Supervisor Angus's behavioral clues prior to her response to me. Uh, and it was disturbing, uh, first of all. Uh, what it told me, though, was that, that her response was going to be visceral. Uh, it was going to come from her subconscious, not her conscious thought, her subconscious. I told you that I studied the mystery traditions. I study the human psyche, uh, consciousness. Um, so let me get to uh, the, the, her statement that she made to me. Uh, she started off by saying, as a Jew. She prefaced that statement, and what that meant was anybody, anything that came after that uh, was supposed to be acceptable. And it was a blanket statement, as though she was speaking for all Jews. Uh, and that's by design, too. You're not supposed to know the difference, especially Christians, uh, fundamental Christians and evangelicals, between uh, cultural Jews, ethnic Jews, religious Jews, secular Jews. You're not supposed to, by design. It allows its victimhood to come out. And uh, I'll read you her first uh, response after she started getting public feed or, uh, feedback. Uh, she went on social media and posted this. Do I not have First Amendment rights, so somehow I have no freedom of speech? I will call out anti-Semitism whenever I see it. If these things go unanswered, we know by history what happens. This is more important than politics, and if you think this not, does not discern, concern all of us as Americans, you're wrong. What did I say that was so bad? I didn't call him a Jew hater. I didn't call him an anti-Semite, which I could have. I told him he was now my mortal enemy. Seems pretty mild to me. I'll never apologize, and I will not take that back. Here's the contradiction. Well, you saw her public apology. It's not anything like 
the first thing that she put on social media. Here's the other one. Uh, the second thing she asked or put on social media, this is obviously an issue I care very strongly about. I lived in Israel for a while, and I had relatives who died in the Holocaust. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Buffer. I'll be back. Okay, Mike Mangana and then Paul Smith. Madam Chair, uh, this is a minor deal compared to what you're dealing with, but I uh, appreciate you all. And um, uh, we're here, I'm here about um, River Avenue. It's a little strip of land that goes from Levy down to Dyke Road, and it's on the original um, plan from 1960 when our parents bought the property. And um, uh, that you guys have gotten involved with it, and you know it's been they've been they've been told to remove their stuff, and they have, but they still keep playing little games with digging up and trying to prevent people from getting down there. We send people. I'm the prior president of the Colorado Riverfront Association, and this goes all the way back to Larry Lively, Bob Lane, and uh, Larry Diatley and Pam Blake. We've been dealing with this for a long time, but um, we need to just make sure they don't, you know, continue to encroach and make it to where we can't get down to the water. I've sent people down there, and then they get verbally blasted, and they leave because they're told it's, you know, not theirs or whatever. They also have these trees that are in a row, and I worry about the county's liability they're eucalyptus trees, so they tend to grow quite uh, high. And if they fall, I think you know trees don't grow in a row. They're planted in a row right down a, a hopeful property line. And, uh, and then when they fall, because the one guy won't trim them, the other guy has tried. But the police have been there. The drone has been flown over it. It's a constant source of consternation for us and we just want to make sure that we're on the same path because the section between dyke and levy is our hopeful way out of when we can't when we come up to the needles highway bridge and we turn right that's fine but when we go to turn left it's very difficult sometimes because of the traffic so we're hopeful to come out to levy and hopefully have a signal there someday where we can turn left. Um, the other possibility is West Shore Drive, which is a, a road that goes along. It's a, I call them paper streets when they're not improved. And that one, you know, is uh, right here. It goes out, but it's not improved. It's not uh, improved. And um, on this map, um, you know, this was supposed to be a park. and. I think this lot here was supposed to be a way out to the river. So I consider this a pocket park that was created by however, you know, whatever reason, and we need to keep it that way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Paul Smith and then Jim Fuller. And after Jim, it, Jim Fuller, Philip Robinson. Madam Chair, uh, board members. Um, I just wanted to ask that you've got a couple agenda items today. One of them was 16. Um, we want to extend contracts, but the contract isn't included with the board information. Um, so I tried looking for those contracts and couldn't find them. So I don't know if that had to do a public what records request or what. If you could include those in the future, that'd be great. Um, then also on 16, I've, I've noticed this on other issues, your board rules state that after a motion is made and a second is given and there's discussion or no discussion, that you will call the question, you will read the, the motion before you vote on it. And that is not happening. I'm really not sure what the motion was on 16. I kind of got the drift of it. But um, either change those rules because they are your written rules or please um, call a question before you vote on it. And then the last one is um, other counties are using the technology uh, video conferencing, which is great. Um, I know that at different times, different board members, 
video in. And I would just like to request that you think about um, allowing your call to the public participants to have that same service that you guys get to enjoy. Um, they're doing it in Cochise County right now. And uh, people that want to talk on different board items can do that remotely. And that technology is developed by know you're utilizing it in some, some ways. So with that, I yield back my minute and 20 seconds. Thank you very much, Mr. Fuller, and then Phil Robinson, and then Chuck DeShazer. Finally got it right. Jim Fuller, Bullhead City. Chairman Hildy and board, thank you much for having me here. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm here today for the Republicans of this county. Uh, I, I'm part of the uh, Mojave County Republican Central Committee for uh, about two and a half years. Uh, I met the group down at uh, Rotary Park on, I believe it was like the 19th of uh, December of 2020, after Trump got ripped off, and I felt I got ripped off. Uh, I hate to see that happen. We're going to be voting for Mr. Trump again, and I hope that we can get him back in there because our country is in big trouble. Uh, as we here in this county, seems like Republicans just beat themselves up better than anybody, and it just breaks my heart. Uh, I, as much as uh, people say I'm a divider, I always speak up here to look forward, have a forward-looking agenda to get along and unite. Uh, I don't want to, and I've said this before in Bullhead City Council meetings, I go to those, I, I think this is my second time here. Um, I lost my home country of Cuba because of communism when I was 10 years old. I witnessed my father get the he was black and blue when when they dumped him at the gate of our farm and a month later on april 13th 1961 was the last time i seen the land that i grew up i don't want to live that twice in my lifetime and i've had some disagreements with a couple folks up there but you know what? My heart, I love this country. I love the United States of America. Let's put aside this little stuff because we're going to lose this place. If we're not careful, we'll have a civil war in this place. Just wait till the grocery stores go empty. It doesn't take long for riots to take place. So, Everything we've gone through, by the way, I didn't take no vaccine. That's a fake darn deal. I never wore a mask except in Bullhead City Transit. That guy wouldn't give me a ride in that bus unless I put one on. So I put one over the top of my head. He wasn't happy with me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Philip Robinson, and then we said Chuck DeShazer, and uh, Mr. Jones, James Jones. Morning, Supervisor, or afternoon, sorry. A um, couple things. Um, this Saturday, all candidates and supervisors are invited to the grand opening at El Cafe. Uh, it starts at noon. Um, then you can meet some of the people out there. This Wednesday, uh, and I'm very proud of this, Danielle... I know you probably all got um, notification and emails. Uh, set this up um, at uh, the GPLO. That's Golden Valley Landowners. Golden Valley Paradise Landowners Building on Birdie uh, out in Golden Valley. We have Engel Homes that is coming out to speak to us. Engel Homes, which you all know, wants to put three thousand dollars or three thousand homes on fourteen hundred acres that they own out there. I'm opposed to it. And um we shouldn't have that. 
economic development, which Jane Bishop was at one of our meetings, we even stated nothing less than an acre and a quarter. Please, board members, come to this meeting. It's very important. All candidates, you all got to vote on it. Angle Homes just wants to be profitable. It's not going to be low cost living. $100,000 homes? Come on, that ain't real cost. Well, maybe nowadays it is, but not to me. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. DeShazer, then James Jones, and then Mr. McClure. Yeah, Chuck DeShazer from Topoc. Uh, I had the opportunity to come to a Republican speaking opportunity the other day for candidates to put out what they wanted. Uh, one thing that I heard there was uh, Gilbert Smaby, our uh, chief building official, say that he should have retired four years ago. And uh, I, I would ask that somebody request that of him because he's been going out there campaigning all over. I don't know how much PTO time he has, but, you know, I find it to be quite a conflict of interest to have the chief building official walking into a business after him saying to me and my wife, it doesn't matter whether something has a permit or doesn't have a permit, I can condemn anything in this county, is what he specifically said to me and my wife. And I don't think that many people would not be intimidated by, you know, mm -hmm. a, a actual official campaigning and saying, will you endorse me? Can I put my picture up in your window or something like that? Uh, and then, like I say, I know I spent at least two hours at this event, and so was, I'm assuming, Patty Paitlin is his assistant or whatever she is. She was there for two hours. I would ask that Sam Elters look into how much time everybody's taking and making sure that they're not just saying it's a lunch hour and suddenly it's three hours later being checked into. Uh, the only other thing I really have to say is I understand that Tim Walsh is leaving to go to Kingman City manager position. Um, I would be willing to fill that hole for 180 days so that they at the end of it would have a policy and procedure manual with the, which they do not have today and hopefully straighten things out. Assuming everything went right and everybody was doing their jobs, he's just a figurehead at this point anyway. I haven't seen him answer a single question in the past couple of years that he didn't call somebody from his staff to give better information than he currently has. Um, the only other thing I have to say today would be on item 31 on the consent agenda. I know it was uh, $350,000 to redo two bathrooms at the library down in uh, uh, Lake Havasu City. I just hope that this is not used as a political point by Mr. Johnson to say, look what I got for you when you know, he barely shows up for meetings here. He doesn't send anybody to represent their library district down in there at the library advisory board. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones, Mr. McClure, and then our last speaker will be our assessor, Gene Kench. Hello, Board of Supervisors. Okay. James okay. Jones from Kingman, Arizona. I just wanted to reiterate something I've already said. And that was to bring a little bit of uh, cohesiveness to the government. And being in your situations, I see that there's a lot of, of uh, it looks, well, let me just say, it looks like we need more than five people to clean up the mess that's been accumulating throughout the years. So I would just like you to put your heads together. Maybe I don't know what the law would say. Maybe have some more meetings, public meetings, because you can't meet behind closed doors. Have some meetings and strategize what you can do to get things moving and get things in the right position that they should be in. For instance, what we just talked about today with, with the medical board, that's a very important uh, uh, subject matter that should have been dealt with before you even were elected. So my suggestion 
is to unify yourselves within, the, within your reach. I know that there's state laws. I think we're going to be talking about some things that the state laws or state statutes are uh, involved in. But you can still use your, your intuition, and you don't have to follow illegal laws. There are Supreme Court rulings that can, can prove my point. I don't have enough time to get into that. But each and every one of you can contribute in a meeting, in a, a brainstorming meeting, and get things done that, instead of kicking the can down the road or putting the cart before the horse or just forgetting about it. So my suggestion is the mode of operandi should be the first uh, agenda, I think, that the Board of Supervisors should have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. McClure and then Ms. Esposito. And signed up also. I got confused with the polling. Right. Right. So you, you wanted to speak at call to public as well? Full disclosure, I'm running for District 2 Supervisor, and Hildy, when I'm moving into your office, first thing I'm going to do is remove the door. You will sign in that you are being recorded, audio, and video. There will be no more swamp deals in District 2. Now let me put, go on before I get back to you, Hildy, about asking for your resignation again. I want to move to a thing that Ryan and you guys are investigating this thing, the situation that happened. Mr. McClurk, if you just state your name, please, for the record. We didn't oh, Jesus Christ. Christ. Please state your name for the record, Mr. Scotty McClure. from Bullhead. Thank you. Go ahead. You guys really know how to screw a concentration up. We have a situation down there where one of our city council board members, Grace Hecht, Miss Hanley Jane Jr., Biggest con artist in town. She went into the voting place down there at the library and started taking videos of it, which is says on the door. No videos, no cameras, etc., no weapons. She went in there and promptly she was thrown the hell out. We always complain about them cheating down there. What in the heck is she doing? A sitting city councilwoman doesn't know how to vote? Are you kidding me? She doesn't excuse herself either on things. And Mayor Biden won't do nothing about it, say, hey, you need to go away. But the thing is, she did it two years ago. I want her prosecuted. Does that look familiar like what you did to me? I want her prosecuted. And I will file as a private citizen charges against her. The thing is, she did it two years ago. Same place, same thing. And I want to thank Lydia Dirch, which I've had a face-to-face -face with her. And especially the poll workers. They promptly, immediately threw her ass out. Immediately. Thank you, poll workers. You did your job perfectly. But she did it before. I will file a thing for you. I've talked to Lydia, and it's up in you. It's already in your court. Now, Hildy, how in the heck did you get this? case that I filed against you at the Bullhead City Police Department, already thrown out. I'm just flabbergasted. Um, I'm refiling it today, this afternoon, probably Wednesday. Now it's cost me a little air time. Here's my civil rights. You get a ticket in town? They f it mailed me a letter and enclosed this thing they get with a traffic ticket. Here's the fines and stuff. The, hey, Scotty, the heck with you. And this is my... they. Did a five page of the civil rights thing on what my rights are in Spanish. Okay, thank you very much. You were going to resign? Ms. Kench, please. Oh, you are our final speaker. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. You know what? You want to select. Okay. Mr. and Mrs. Esposito? All right, my wife read me the Riot Act and asked me to apologize for going off topic into my public. Sir, if you could just state your name, please. 
Mr. Esposito, Mr. Jeff Esposito, King in Arizona. All right, so if we're going off topic into the, my public hearing, uh, call to public uh, subjects, uh, I was confused because you pulled item 16, so I apologize. And uh, I will call people by their, uh, their official positions. All right. Good to hear the rumor on the campaign donations to Supervisor Angus put to rest. Supervisor Langfelter unblocked Chris Rodarty and other constituents. Supervisor Bishop, Mr. Martin confirmed that private meeting in media did uh, take place. Uh, I would ask you in the future to include all in, uh, candidates with uh, meetings in future meetings with usually unaccessible officials. I was not vaxxed with the weapon of mass destruction because the medical military industrial complex nearly killed me in 1979 with live swine flu virus vaccine. It is a weapon. Thank you, Ms. Esposito. Thank you, Chairman and Board. Jennifer Esposito, District 4 County Supervisor Candidate, Kingman, Arizona. Uh, I had planned on discussing the recent uh, Supreme Court decision which said that uh, elected officials cannot block constituents and or they can be sued, approving again that I was right about the law and actually Judge Jansen was wrong. So yes, uh, Travis Lingenfelter should unblock Chris Rodarty, anyone else he has blocked as should anyone else that might be a constituent. However, what I'd really like to talk about today is ARS 11-410, use of county resources to influence the outcome of an election. Recently, Supervisor Lingenfelter tagged me in a post wherein he made the most vile and disgusting allegations against his opponent. However, he uploaded a photo from our county treasurer, uh, and it was clear that the photo had not been cropped. It was a screenshot, and it said it was from Sue Ann. And when confronted by these allegations, as they were one by one discounted at a recent Republican meeting, he did confront our treasurer, who most disturbingly referenced the fact that she was looking into, quote, his ranch in relationship to her job. Now, his ranch is apparently in his adoptive brother's name, not in his name. I can't imagine any reason that any county official would be looking into something that's not in someone's name in the course of their business. But she said that she did not share the picture with uh, Supervisor Lingenfelter, which he has subsequently confirmed. She shared it with another elected official. There's only a short list of elected officials here in Mojave County. I'm not sure who the unnamed elected official was, but we can assume that it's not Lydia Durst since she was appointed. So Travis needs to come clean and uh, state who gave him that photo, or our treasurer can come clean and state who she gave it to. Uh, we don't know, given the date on the screenshot, it was probably disseminated or passed around to an unknown number of individuals over about a five-week period. The problem is, is this opens up the county to liability. If any county resources, staff, emails, county-issued cell phones, or anything else was used to investigate Mr. Meisner or any other candidate running for office, quote, as part of someone's job. I'm just making you aware of this because Mr. Meisner contacted Sheriff Schuster, who uh, accepted the evidence and is uh, investigating the matter. I also think that because Sheriff Schuster issued a, quote, testimonial, although not an endorsement, for Travis Lingenfelter, it would be appropriate to assign this investigation to an outside agency, the kind of outside agency that can forensically examine county computers, county-issued cell phones, see if they were indeed or not used in uh, inappropriate ways, and whether or not any evidence may have been deleted, because then that would be a Class 6 felony. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Kench. Good morning, board. Chairman Angus. I am Jeannie Kench, your Mojave County Assessor. This morning, the Mojave Minutes will be focusing on a bill myself, Representative Gillette, and Representative Biasucci have been working very hard on. This Thursday, HB 2581, the Physical Presence Bill, will be heard in the Senate Committee on Government. 
We are very excited that Senator Hoffman, chairman of the committee, has included our bill on the agenda. A little history. While our team in the, in the assessor's department was creating our new classification form, we realized that there was no definition of being an Arizona resident. We were shocked that there was no definition. So we brought our concern to Representative Gillette. Representative Gillette was shocked as well and started looking into it. There have been some sort of definition, there has to be some sort of definition to be an Arizona resident, you would think. It affects not only the assessor's office, but also snowbirds from other states and the requirement with the Department of Transportation as well as the recorder's department as to who would qualify for voter registration. And I am certain many more departments that have not even been discussed. The physical presence bill will require 181 days present in Arizona, the same as the federal government requires to be labeled an Arizona resident. One can qualify sooner than the 181 days with proof of employment, rental or purchase of a residence, active duty military, and students. One can only declare one state for federal taxes. This clarifies requirements for declaring Arizona as your residence. Since it is required to be a resident in order to qualify for the assessor's exemption or senior freeze programs, this bill will help shore up any confusion with appeals to the applications process. I am thrilled HB 2581, the physical presence bill, uh, has moved forward to committee. If anyone would like to write the senators in supporting the bill, contact Senators Hoffman, Diaz, Farnsworth, Mendez, Stamp, Senderation, Wadsack, or Rogers with your support. Or, or post your comments on the RTS program if you have access. We are still working to get our notary bill, HB 2588, to a committee as well. We are working with the Secretary of State's office to get this bill over the finish line. I will keep you updated on, on this very important bill that focuses on notary requirements helping to prevent deed fraud. Thank you again for your time and allowing me to share with you this week's Mojave Minute. Thank, Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak a call to public who hasn't already spoken? Okay, we're going to close the call to public. Now we go to the regular agenda. Um, Supervisor Bishop, would you like me to move 46 up? Because I think there's someone who's been sitting patiently. I would love that. Would you like that? Okay, so we're going we're gonna to go to item 46, which is discussion possible action to approve a District 4 projects for the distribution of America Rescue Plan ARPA funds the amount of 28889 to the Oatman Fire District. And... Um, I believe, Supervisor Bishop, that we have Gail Robinson here. Yes, Gail Robinson is the chief of the Oatman Volunteer Fire Department, and uh, she has uh, understandably asked for assistance with her department uh, with transportation issues uh, in purchasing a vehicle that can get through the crowded streets of Oatman when necessary, as well as uh, uh, be able to travel into the more rugged four-wheel drive areas. So, Ms. Ms. Gill, Chief. Uh, Madam Board, Supervisors, Ms. Bishop, I want to be here on, again, I'm the Oatman Fire Chief, Gail Robinson. Been the chief for two and a half years. Um, we've rebuilt the department from ground up. And being put on the agenda today is a great deal for Oatman in itself, as this will enable me and my crew to easily access the desert area and get through the crowded streets of Oatman to enable and enhance our response times and be able to get to areas that we can't currently get with the equipment that we don't have. So I appreciate it, and thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? No other questions, but I'm, I'm very happy to be able to uh, help the, the Oatman Fire Department with this uh, very small ask with ARPA monies, and uh, I look forward to seeing the vehicle in use there. Okay, we'll put in the motion. I make a motion that we approve. Aye. Motion second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Congratulations. Item 35, this was brought by Development Services, discussion possible action to direct staff to begin the public process to change the automation fee from a flat $40 fee to a 3.5% fee including public hearings at the Building Code Advisory Board and the Planning and Zoning Commission for review and recommendation. Uh, do we have Mr. Walsh on the line? We have the wrong director. Madam Chair, yes, I'm on. Okay. Maybe we can get your picture on. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
We'll just have Steve move his lips. All right, while I he'll talk. be uh, okay. <laughs> channeling you. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. This item um, back in 2006, the automate well 2005-2006, the automation fee was established uh, to assist in funding um, permitting and 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 those types of uh, costs. Uh, one of the big costs being our, our permitting software. Um, over the years, our expenses have increased as, as we've had a, a number of new items that we've had to purchase and a number of new uh, ways to provide uh, service through electronic means to our customers. Um, some of the latest, as uh, County Manager Elters mentioned today, we uh, have our online permitting up and running. A big uh, thank you to IT and all the hard work that they did on that. And uh, just uh, all of these these services that we, we are trying to provide in order to um, improve our, our customer service and improve the experience for our customers, um, they do come at a cost, and these these fees and, and costs that we're experiencing um, have really increased. One thing that we've seen, um, and, and I'm sure Nathan can I explain this a lot better than I have, I can, but um, in, in recent years, a lot of the uh, software services have gone from on-site um, to a cloud-based service. And, uh, you know, with that, you have your annual fees and all of that. And we, we looked at our, our automation fees and since 2005, 2006, we've charged a flat $40 fee across the board for everything from a, a residential house, you know, 1,500 square foot house, all the way up to a, a 250,000 square foot warehouse building. Um, I think anybody looking at those can can definitely see that you know that 250,000 square foot warehouse building with all the uh, the amenities going into it requires quite a bit more um, bandwidth and and uh, storage in order to to be able to accept that review it and and provide the, those services. So uh, what this proposal is is it's a proposal to switch from a, a flat forty dollar fee to a a three and a half percent fee. And what that would do is for your fifteen hundred square foot house, you're looking at you know maybe an increase of of, of five dollars for a, a larger house maybe an increase of around $20 for that, that fee. Um, but as you get up to your, your larger, uh, larger buildings, um, the ones that require a lot more uh, work and, and a lot more uh, services through those, those automation um, processes, um, those are, are gonna start paying, a, a, those, under this proposal, those would pay a larger portion of that. But again, looking at the overall cost of the project, it would be just, you know, that three and a half percent of the, the permit fee. So um, what we're asking for here is is for the board to approve this this proposal, This not, not to approve the, the fees at this point, but rather approve the, the proposal of taking this, um, proposal to the building code advisory board for their input um, and then to the planning and zoning commission for their input and then bring it back to the board for a, a final decision. With that, I'd be so happy to board. answer any questions. Any questions? Madam no, Chair. Yes, Supervisor Langenfelter. Director Walsh, um, right now the fee is, is a flat $40 fee for large economic development projects as well. That's any permitting fee, um, whether it be planning and zoning or building, it's a, a flat $40 fee. I, Chairman. on the phone on video sorry i apologize my my uh my volume got cut there i, I wasn't I, unable to hear anything that supervisor lingenfelter just asked oh, if there's a question okay yeah. then then i don't expect director walsh i don't expect you to have the answer to that so thank you okay so i can i can hear you now sorry about that okay he was talking about well you talked about putting a cap on um maybe the, the real big ones which yeah. kind of makes well, sense well, to if, me. They, if they're bringing let's say 
significant new net employment, if they're bringing significant uh, capital investment to Mojave County, um, right now they're paying 40 bucks. So I, was, I just wanted to know if economic development has looked at that as far as maybe capping it for those very large economic development projects. Madam Chair, yeah. uh, Supervisor Ligafelter, what you'd be approving here today is the approach or the concept. It will go to the um, Building Advisory Code Committee as well as the Planning and Zoning uh, Commission. In the process, we would be happy to have Tammy assess the impact of this 3.5% and maybe maybe float or suggest to you some cap if that is in order, but we would have time to do so, uh, Madam Chair and Supervisor Lugavelter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Does that sound good to you? Madam Chair, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, pleasure of the board. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, Mr. DeShazer, you have signed it. Yes, uh, Chuck DeShazer, Topak, Arizona. Um, my comments on this issue come down to I have asked four different people at the uh, development services what this automation fee does and it seems to me that it's them just doing their job and they have budgets that we're paying our taxes for all the time that they should be able to if we don't need it entered into computers and stuff like that, why do we have employees over at Development Services to do that? Um, the other thing is I looked at my uh, one and only permit that I've ever pulled in this county for a rabbit hutch this morning, <laughs> and it says miscellaneous fee, $40, and uh, the entire fee for an electrified, plumbed, and you know, with all the inspections being footing, framing, uh, electrical, plumbing, the initial power pole on the property was a total of $144 with that $40 fee. So it's almost 30%, 28 to 30% of the entire project. Um, and then on top of everything else, uh, these people over there that don't seem to know what they're doing have retroactively removed the final signature from my permit card just because uh, the inspector signed off on it and so now there is no power on the property due to the fact that they don't know what's going on over there and I think they need to budget in their $40. Yeah, this, this doesn't really have anything to do with this agenda. Well, it is the $40 fee that was one-third of the project okay. because on top of everything else, they should be budgeting all of their permit fees okay. and, and just eliminate this automation fee. All right, thank you. Uh, anyone have any further discussion? Motion approved. Second. Motion second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay, that was for the one. Motion carried. Number 36, discussion possible action approve of the pros work plan for the 2025 Mojave County General Plan update. Madam Chair, thank we you. Uh, it's withdrawn, I said that before. Yes, sir, Mr. Walsh. Yes. This is the uh, the general plan update. Um, this is it's been ten years since we had our last general plan update. So by statute, uh, we're gearing up for the, uh, the the next general plan update that is due next year. Um, in the backup, you had a, a, a schedule of proposed meetings throughout the county. Um, our intent is to reach out and meet with the individuals in each of these these communities and to uh, solicit their input for the general plan and any um, any ideas or any suggestions they might have. Uh, part of the, the plan, uh, part of the, the proposal is to create a committee um, basically selecting one of each of the district's commissioners to create a, a general plan committee. Um, their their role would be to review the comments and the uh, suggestions that we received during all of our community meetings and then uh, translate those into proposed revisions into the general plan. Um, once all of those revisions are, are put together, uh, it would be sent to uh, the board for, for comment, sent out to all of the stakeholders for comment, 
Um, once those comments are received, it would then be presented to the Planning and Zoning Commission for review and then their recommendation to the Board of Supervisors. So um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. We'd be happy to amend our plan in any way that the board would like and appreciate okay. your time. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments? None? Motion approved. Second. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Number 37 from Public Works. Discussion possible action acknowledge receipt of and refer to Public Works a petition requesting the East Palo Cristi Court and North Palo Cristi Drive to end of cul de sac. End of the cul de sac. What? Sorry, I thought you were done. Oh, okay, I'm done. Anyone signed up? Excuse me? Anyone signed up to speak on this? No. Motion to approve. Second. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Oh, okay. And item 38. I won't even read it. <laughs> Motion to approve. Second. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay. Motion carried. Item 39, discussion and possible action to approve the distribution of previously approved remaining $45,245.21 in ARPA funds allocated to district through funding agreements to purchase the completion of the various Colorado River. BMX track improvements, this is mine. This is the ex, this is still part of the initial allotment that I gave right, way back when. Motion to approve. Thank you. Second. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Number 40, approve the following exceptions to the general fund hiring freeze. Motion to approve. Second. I'll second that. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Number 41, discussion of possible action. Receive the briefing from the Public Health Department regarding the vaccine regimen for infants and children, what is required to attend public school. Madam Chair, Supervisors, good afternoon. Uh, just here to answer any questions from the information that we provided. Did you, did you want more of an explanation? You can recognize me. No. Oh, I'm so sorry, <laughs> Supervisor Green. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I watched the video of the Board of Health meeting, mm -hmm. and I found it interesting that you used the VAERS system that everybody told us to ignore during the COVID to determine how many uh, childhood vaccine injuries had occurred in Arizona and Mojave County. And then you extra use that data to extrapolate that uh, people would be at more risk if they were vaccinated individually rather than receive 11 vaccinations um, simultaneously. And I'm curious, now that's been reported in the newspaper also, um, I'm curious if you found any studies that actually prove that, and ones preferably that are not funded by vaccine companies. Um, on those points, so what I, with VAERS, I said, because the information that we pulled and provided was all of Arizona, not specific to Mojave County, and the numbers were small, I said it potentially identified an issue but it's just the information that was being provided, and that's what's there. Um, I haven't further, because of that, um, those points on on this study, that study, I haven't too. If you'd like me to do an extensive study of that, I can, and I can bring that back. Uh, I'm just concerned now that that's now from your uh, seat of the pants um, review of the, the unreliable VAER system. Um, in the case of my great-granddaughter, the doctor said, well, it might be a vaccine injury. So I'm seriously doubt that he put it in there as a vaccine injury. And, um, and, and for that point, that wasn't the only point that was brought. That was just one of the, of the other points that we examined that was put in there. I put everything in. If I left it out, they could say, why didn't you include that? It's there. That's the information that's provided. And it's to be interpreted. If the board wants to interpret it how they see or discard it, that's... That's your purview. Um, did you do anything over um, pressuring people to rec receive vaccines? Uh, we did review that process. Uh, just uh, 
We provided the, the walkthrough on that process of what currently occurs. Lynn Valentine did, has been sitting with her staff in the front to review that process and uh, reviewing over again. Again, we have uh, our nursing supervisor or a nurse practitioner who has overseen this project for 14 years as well as our program coordinator and that and uh, reviewing over the process and reviewed everything and reviewed all those points again with staff again. Uh, how long between when a person checks in to when they're actually vaccinated? That can vary. They might be the only one there, so it'd be pretty quick. It would just depend on the vaccine clinic days on how many are signed up. So um, it could be they could sign in and be the only person there, so they'd get the prompt service. Or it could be that they'd sign in, but I would say on average, 10 minutes. Yeah. You feel that's sufficient to allow them to read the, what, dozen pieces of paper that they're given? Um, and that would be up to them. That's part of their responsibility. At a time we can say when you're when you're available. If they're the only ones there, then obviously we'd be able to say, do you need more time, or is it is to read it? They they can put in their part. I need more time to read this and review those materials. We could also assume that they have reviewed the material before they came in. Are they informed that vaccine vaccinations are not required in the state of Arizona, neither for adults nor for school children? That's available on all our forms there and it's up to them. I That's, didn't see it on any of the forms that I've reviewed that were obtained by my assistant from the health department in Lake Havasu. From those forms, on saying those points, if they would say, is it required, if they would ask us on those, our nurses are there to explain what's available to them and what's recommended. To say they do not need it, it's up to them. That's 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 their decision. I believe that most people are under the impression that these are mandatory for school children. They're mandatory for the school institution. They can sign a waiver at that school saying that they, due to personal reasons, X, Y, Z, that's allowed in the law. They're allowed to waive that and enter the school. And the school at the, the school will provide that if they show up to school and they say to the school, you know what, I don't want to vaccinate my children. Well, then the school will say, okay, well, here's a personal waiver. That waiver is then maintained in the school, and the school is then if by law, such as an example would be if a measles case outbreaks, then they're required to be outside the school 21 days if an outbreak does occur in the school. But other than that, the school is the one that provides them that waiver that allow them to do that. And so they're informed they're at the school or daycare. This is also daycare, is there any, child, any daycare that is licensed, not a home one that you know says five to 10 that does a home business, is not inspected, but any inspected licensed daycare facility that would be watching children six months and above, they are also required to have those vaccinations or to provide a waiver to the parents. I'm just concerned that we have some responsibility since we're the people that are administering these vaccines to at least tell the people that they don't, they're not required to do this. And it is a voluntary service. They come into our door. We play nanny state on everything that we do. So this is the one thing that we're not going to play nanny state on? It's rhetorical, not, so you don't really Yeah, it's rhetorical. I, I don't know how to answer that. It's the point I'm putting forward. This is, this, this is, we follow the law. This is what the law requires us to do, and this is what we put forward. If those laws need to be changed, and then it's up to the people to go and change those. It also appeared to me from the discussion of the Board of Health that they were more concerned in liability of, of not if they were to actually push off, uh, let's say, whooping cough and the child would then get whooping cough, that somehow the county would be liable for that. And I, I just think we should be more concerned about the safety of our citizens than we should be about the liability to the, the county and that something like that should happen. And I believe we take every measure we can to provide that information and uh, the resources that are available for those uh, for those individuals. On the VAERS, you know, it does show those indications of what's the percentage, you know, at the same time when we were saying, just an example, when we were going through COVID, it was easily brought up, this is no more than a flu, this percentage of how many are going to die or be affected. So, you know, why are we doing this? This number is even smaller than that. So the, why doesn't that argument also apply here on those points? And so when you, unfortunately, yes, when we start to st speak about statistics, how many people are affected, yeah, it does, it dehumanizes it. And I understand, and I agree. I mean, so if we're going to put, a, if we're going to humanize this at the same time, then yes, are we taking every measure possible, you know, what that's allowed to us? But there, there comes a point that the liability and the choice is the parents. And I believe, well, I I believe that's enshrined in our laws. Because the, the, 
whoever was working that day with my granddaughter assured her three times it would be okay, and it wasn't okay. Okay. Um, and if you want to look at this from just from, and I'm not saying that you're doing this, but from a cold-hearted money position, that cost somebody $94,000 to airlift that child to Phoenix No, on top of whatever it costs to have her in the hospital for two days. So if you just want to look at it from a money issue, um, it doesn't look good to me from a money issue either. And I, I agree. Should be, if you want to have informed consent, we should also be informing those people they don't have to do this at all. And I agree those are all valid points, and it's not an easy system. And I agree those access to care and disparities, and that goes into those hated words of equity and disparities, and who has access, who can pay for health care, who can't pay for health care, what's available, what's the benefits we get from that. But it's the preferable board. If, if you want to make a decision on this, you feel your constituents want that, you want a direction, you can't provide that. Uh, we provide all the points. Um, if there's liability to it and you want to take the risks there on those points, then that's up to the board. Thank you, sir. Okay, Supervisor Wiggenfelter. Thank you, Chairman Angus. Dr. Kingsley, how are you this afternoon? Um, since our last discussion on this, I, I tried to educate myself a little bit about it, but I want to ask with some, um, some clarifying questions. So being one of the newer supervisors, what is the County of Mojave Public Health Department's policy? Um, how did we come up with what what guidance we follow for those individuals that are in utero to 12 months? In utero or to you know, 12 months? So this is for vaccination, right? In so utero, the first vaccines. year. The first yeah. year. Yeah. Well, so the, for the first year. Yeah. So vaccines are the most out of out of all our pharmaceutical industry. They are the longest and, and most researched. Yeah. There's a lot of yeah. on that point. And how did we come up with that? It would be the Centers for Disease or the health the health system of the federal government which was enshrined into ARS law. Let me clarify my question a little bit. So is our, is our role as a public health department for those that are just zero to one years old um, or zero to five even for kindergarten, um, is our role to get them to the level where they can attend a daycare and a public school? Or do we go beyond those requirements? Because let me tell you why I ask. Uh -huh. I researched it, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Arizona law requires that students entering kindergarten have to have five doses of DTAP, DTP, or DT. Mm -hmm. They have to have four doses of polio, and they have to have three doses of hepatitis B. And that's all that's required to, to, to go to school. I mean, daycare require, may require more. I don't know. But it seems like the list that we went over last time was there was a lot more shots on that list than mm -hmm. just those shots. And so then I researched a little further and I found something. Um, do you know about the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act of 1986? I'm familiar with it, but yeah. I, well, I, I, I researched a test that. on it. And I researched that pre that 1986 act, there was five shots that were required. After the post-1986 act, which gave pharma companies immunity for vaccine injuries or deaths, there was 32 shots. So I guess my question is, as a public agency that is providing a service to the public, and like you said, it's optional. They can go to a primary care physician. They can come here. They can go wherever they want, right? That's their personal mm -hmm. decision. Um, but why don't we, I guess my ultimate question is, why don't we just provide those shots that are required by Arizona state law to, to uh, either attend a daycare if you're under five years old or the the you know fewer shots to attend, attend and enroll in a public school kindergarten. That's my question. Why do we why, why do, do we, we provide that? So the other the other shots. So the schedule is provided from recommended through verifying. This is also pediatrician healthcare providers that have all weighed into this across the nation. Some agree, some don't uh, on those points. Um, and just saying that from that time. Um, that's leading up to it. What are those ones? And there's different, there's different times. So there's the six months, 12, month, 12 months, and there's different times that vaccines are that. So if someone had never been vaccinated and they show up on the first day of school and what's required, they would have to catch up in order to get to that, and to that point. So there is a series, and it's just how the immune system, they believe on those certain points, have they seen how the immune system has responded? And so being able to provide those, those shots. So, but 
w asking what do we do and there's there's a lot of it's a, a complicated system previously majority of of health care providers in Arizona provided the vaccines you know so it, they're in the office but due to cost of it and reimbursement of 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 that it has shifted and it's falling back on us previously we were the the secondary line secondary line for ministry immunizations when it used to be primarily the doctors but due to uh, stipulations that rightly so need to be revisited by the federal government when any time a private they were being penalized for not using a certain amount of vaccines for waste and so many of our private providers stopped doing it so now we're becoming the last entity in the county to be able to provide those um, but there, are, uh, it's, but there are a few that still do. Um, the, uh, North Country and Borders do provide, but majority of our uh, private providers do not anymore because of those complications of billing and reimbursement. Um, so necessarily, we were the the secondary line of defense, but now we have gone up. We our numbers have gone up because of those things. But why don't we offer? So when somebody comes in, we offer what's recommended for them at their age. And so that's what we recommend. Then they make that decision where they want. We show them the ones that are needed for school, and we show them ones that are elective. A lot of time, the majority of the electives are turned down from the flu, COVID. Yeah. Those are turned down. So we just provide a recommendation that's based on, um, right now, Arizona Administrative Code, what's based in there, as well as what's uh, provided through our federal government. And on those points, what is recommended at that age. That's the recommended. Well, these are the ones that are recommended that are needed. For school or for daycare, these ones are elective, and we provide them the option. And I guess that's the that's the policy question that I don't really expect you to have an answer to. Um, but as a political subdivision of the state of Arizona, should we only be administering or offering those that are actually required by state law, um, and and just staying away from the and the elective? I, yeah, and I believe it through our contract, and that is part of it. So I did contact. You know, spoke with Arizona's health. Sorry, so we can and funding wise, we wouldn't lose our funding if, you know, if just because a parent chooses a different schedule, we don't lose our funding. We follow what's recommended on those points, and then the parent makes a decision from there. But if anyone walks in the door and asks for a vaccination, we are required by 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 our law to provide that. Thank you, doctor. That's all the questions I have. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Are we forcing anybody to get shots in Mojave County? Nope, it's completely voluntary. They walk in the door. My thing is, I understand where everybody's coming from. People come in and ask for these shots. Um, the idea of having different shots maybe aren't aren't required for school or something. A lot of this, we're just helping the citizens out who have no other way. Well, they might not have a doctor to get these shots. So I guess my thing is, parents come in or... Adults come in and they need shots, and we provide that shot basically free of charge. Um, I, I don't see a problem with what we're doing. Supervisor Bishop. I have to agree with Supervisor Johnson. Uh, parents come to get their children vac uh, vaccines, and maybe we can emphasize uh, the parent has the ultimate responsibility to make those choices for the underage child. but. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea to change uh, the recommendations from the state. It opens the, the department up to uh, legal concerns. And parents ultimately um, have to make those hard decisions for their kids. Okay. Anyone else? All right. I do have some people signed up. Did you want to say something, Mr. Gold? Okay. We do have some people signed up, Mr. Beffert. Supervisors, for the record, my name is Greg Befford. I just want to read a quote here from Bertrand Russell. Diet, injections, and injunctions, which are court orders to either compel people to do something or not do something. Right, Mr. Esplin, am I close on that? Combine from a very early age to produce the sort of character and the sort of beliefs that the authorities consider desirable. And any serious criticism of the powers that will be, that will be, will become psychologically impossible. Any criticism of the powers that be will become psychologically impossible. That's our compulsory education system at work right there. Even if all are miserable, all 
will believe themselves happy because the government will tell them that they are so. Okay. I watched the health department meeting. I read the transcripts. And again, like most government, it's about what they don't talk about. It's about what they ignore intentionally in most cases. The questions that weren't asked. Like, for example, why after everything that we know now about COVID-19 and all the information that I've sent to you people, including the email I sent this morning, and I apologize for the delay on that, outlining the harm, demonstrably the harm that the COVID-19 vaccine causes, including children, not just VARES, which is underreported, and you know that, DMED data, Medicaid and Medicare data, the harm that these injections have caused, it's a crime against humanity, and it's becoming more and more apparent. There were Senate hearings. You had Senator Johnson. I sent you the video on his hearing on COVID and the experts. It's not me talking, you know. But again, I don't have to be a virologist or an epidemiologist to know that it makes no sense and there's no cost-benefit analysis available that you can tell me that justifies giving a an infant, a, a small child that has a 0.02% chance of getting COVID, a vaccine? What common sense does that make? None. So then you have to question, what, you're following CDC and, and, and FDA guidelines. What justification do you have, Doc, following corrupt CDC and FDA guidelines? Demonstrably so. I'll debate it. I'll debate it with any of you, any of them, any of the PhDs, the, uh, the learned folks at this meeting who attached a boilerplate letter word for word from two pediatricians outlining the benefits of vaccines and word for word. That was the, the academic rigor that these two folks provided in the analysis of this. The question was flawed to begin with, Supervisor Gould. Can I continue? I'll give you 30 seconds. I appreciate that. Thank you. It was flawed from the beginning. The question at this point should not be, should we be looking at the schedule and whether or not giving them all at once is going to cause a reaction? And I'm telling you right now, the, the, the thing that the doctor came up here and said about giving them all together uh, actually reduces the risk. I want to see the studies. You show me the studies on that. You show me the studies on that. Now, the other thing is that I've given you more than enough information. You know, the FDA has withheld, tried to withhold information from the adverse Mr. Beffert, I'm so sorry, but we, for the sake, we need to, to move on. Does I, anybody else have any questions of me? Supervisor Gould, how about the proclamation that I sent you? Any questions? Mr. Beffert. Can clarify? Mr. Beffert, please. We need to find the six Thank recommendations. You. I'm sorry? We need to find the six recommendations. Uh, they're in there. We'll talk about this another time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buffer. All right, Jeff Esposito. In the backup uh, literature for this agenda item, there's an executive summary uh, where it says the administrative code R96702 uh, it has a bunch of uh, supposed mandatory vaccina vaccines. There is no COVID vax on that list. Um, the citizens of Mojave County have been targeted with biological and technological weapons of mass destruction and have lost and will continue to lose friends and family to these same weapons of mass destruction. Any device or object involving a biological agent, which is defined in say, any microorganism, virus, infectious substance, or biological product capable of causing death, disease, or other biological malfunction in a human, is a weapon of mass destruction. Nanotechnology present in the COVID-19 injections qualify as devices designed and intended to cause harm as does the use of te such technology and or a biological agent resulting in death or harm. Repeatedly distributing a biological agent and device causing harm in mass, especially after it is well known to cause harm, qualifies it as a weapon of mass destruction and a biological weapon. The position is ind indisputable. The county employees continue to, continue to allow the distribution of these biological 
biological agents, which makes them an accessory after the fact. Targeting residents with a biological agent and devices that cause harm in mass, including death and disability, meets the threshold of treason. This is biological warfare against the human population. Once it was known that these injections cause harm, continuing to promote them and distribute them is an act of terrorism, 18 United States Code 2381. A Pfizer report on the rollout of the COVID-19 nanoparticle injections from December 2020 through February 2021 demonstrate over 200,000 adverse cases and incidents and 1,223 deaths. Every single human being that died or will die as a result of these lethal injections is a fact of in fact, a murder victim. There was never informed consent. There was coercion and deception. Once deception was used, and the fact that informed consent was not present, and the fact that once it became clear that these injections were in fact harmful and their distribution continued, there was no, there was an intent to harm and resulting deaths can constitute murder. We have been baited like insects. Dark field live blood analysis demonstrated that not only are hydrogels and self-assembling nanotechnology present in the blood of the vaccinated, they are also present in the blood of the unvaccinated due to shedding of this technology. This list must be shortened to the legal requirements, the five that Mr. Supervisor Lingfelder said. Uh, stop this nonsense. Get rid of some of these facts. Thank you. Ms. Esposito. James Jones after and then Armin Stang. Thank you, uh, Chairman and Board. Um, I'm directing you to the recent uh, interview that Tucker Carlson did, showing that uh, the COVID vaccination killed more people than the Vietnam War. Might want to take a look at that. Now, you know, hindsight being 2020, we we realize that this was essentially. Uh, this was the experiment and that the populace was experimented on the difference between emergency youth officers, emergency use authorization and um, approval are not the same thing. Something that I spoke about repeatedly during the time. Um, I hope you all read the supporting documents. I did. One of the things is that the CDC recommendation for children is for the COVID vaccine in the program. Uh, Recently, you said that you weren't going to renew the contract for the county to um, distribute that, and that was a, the correct thing to do. To hell with the administrative code, to hell with standard of care, because as we know, during COVID, that was a deadly filled Ebola drug and uh, ventilators, which probably killed more people than the virus. Um, standard of care for cancer probably kills more people than cancer or, or shortens their lives, essentially. Standard of, to hell with standard of care. Once you know better, you do better. The problem that we have is, is if we go with uh, Dr. Kingsley's recommendation, uh, in, in using the CDC's guidelines, that um, the combination of these things has never been tested. Even on vaccines that are approved, they, there is absolutely no testing, no research on the effects of combining these things. Uh, vaccines routinely use things like toxic aluminum. Why? To create a reaction in your immune system. More and more aluminum in multiple doses, probably not a good idea. I may not be a doctor, but even I'm smart enough to figure that one out. Uh, lipid nanoparticles uh, purchased from China, not probably a good thing to, you know. When you combine things, most medical people should know this. There's something called a synergistic effect. So uh, while one thing might be bad, combining it with other things tends to make them more bad. My husband, as he's previously stated, was almost killed by a vaccine. When we got married and I met my grandson, I took one look at this child who clearly had encephalitis and actually was diagnosed and, and had to be treated. And I said to my husband, this looks like a vaccine injured child. And he said, don't you dare say that to my family. Well, now it's out in the public. There it is. But I, I maintain that my grandson Excuse me, I have time left. Where did it go? Where did it go? Hello? We didn't do this on purpose. Um, testing. Oh, there I am. I lost a few seconds, but uh, 
but there it is. And I maintain that my grandchild is probably, as well as uh, Supervisor Gold was stating, a victim of this practice. So don't be cowards, okay? Um, you set policy. He follows policy. Why don't you make it policy that the exemption for all parents be provided with a conformed and sent form? Thank you. Thank you. James Jones and then Armin Stang. Hello again, uh, Board of Supervisors. Very important subject. I don't believe that um, the government has any jurisdiction or right to be involved in the medical field. That's my personal opinion. You take it from where it is. But to further what uh, Representative Ron Gould and, and uh, Representative Travis Lienfelder was uh, looking at and talking about, let's take not only the, the shots that are being given, which in my opinion, and from what the testimony we could bring in a, in a court of law, is this poison. It's a biological poison. The CDC, in my research, is a nonprofit organization, quasi-government agency. Do you really feel comfortable with listening to a nonprofit? They have no jurisdiction in government. They're only making recommendations. And here again, not only the... <laughs> This is, this is so crazy what the CDC is doing, is they're going to the manufacturers and getting their information, and Congress has given the manufacturers amnesty, basically. They, have no, they don't have any, anybody to, uh, to have to, to, to um, uh, have to account for what they've done. So if they are not a, a accountable to anybody, they can get away with whatever they want to do. As Board of Supervisors at the county level, what do you feel that you should do? Where is your responsibility? I want you to think about that. I want you to, to think what I was talking about earlier, about getting together as one group, one mindset, and not as five different people. And I think we're getting on the right, tra the right track here. And I appreciate you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Jones. And again, thank you for having me here. Um, with the problem with the vaccination, why don't you put a flyer out, recommend it, not recommend it? Have the parents sign them. That's the first paper they get. And then with the COVID shots, well, in the 1930s and 1940s, there were some doctors in the world who were experimenting with vaccines. In the Nuremberg trials, they got condemned to death. Well, wonder why. You know, non-approved vaccines, according to the Nuremberg trials, are not supposed to be administered on humans. I haven't seen any studies yet on the COVID vaccine that it helps anybody. That kind of sounds like Agenda 21, Agenda 36, and the One World Order. Get rid of people so we don't have so many people we need to keep under control. That's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stang. Okay, that wraps up people who have signed up to speak. Supervisor Gould, your item. Um, I think we should uh, get a inform the people that go in for vac for vaccination for their, themselves and their children that there's no state law re that requires that they're vaccinated. And that there's no that their children can still attend school if they're not vaccinated, and I think that should be provided to them, and that they should sign that before they go any further into the vaccination program. Okay. Anyone else? Maybe say about that. Okay. Do you want to make a motion? Oh, Supervisor Johnson. I just think if you're going to have kids, you got to know the rules. It shouldn't be up to us to tell you what they are. <laughs> 
yeah, I make that as a motion. Okay. Supervisor Bishop, do you have something to say? Okay. Not anymore. Okay. Um, we have a motion. All second, if we're going to provide a service, I think we should at least say for those parents that maybe aren't as diligent, they maybe don't do as much research as others, um, what they're mandated to, to have for a daycare program or kindergarten or, and those that are um, elective. Um, okay, so we have a motion and a second. I'll just say that more information is always good. So with that, yes. Chairman Angus, the motion is to uh, to continue with our process, but add a right. disclaimer sheet for the parent. Yes, that they should see first mm -hmm. and sign. Isn't that continuing the nanny state we talk about? Now we're giving them another piece of information. We're not letting them make their own decisions. Uh -huh. I, I think there's so much information out there, right? And that I think that a lot of, especially younger people, think that they have to get these shots in order to go to school. I mean, um, so again, I, I don't think it's, it's a, much of a leap to say that they should have that information before they, they do this. You know, we've become very compliant. So there's no, there's no harm in it, I think. All right, so we have a motion. Yes, Supervisor Bishop. So I just wanted to add that I, I don't think I've ever received a vaccine where I sat there and read what all the uh, the things that could happen to you. And if, if you read everything, I mean, they put everything in the world out there that uh, could happen to you. Usually it doesn't, but it could. Right. So, um, um, Supervisor Bishop, I, I just think that this is to tell people that they don't have to. It's not giving them a, three pages to read. It's just saying that Arizona law does not mandate that they do absolutely it. i don't have a problem with okay. adding a, a, a more information and you know if they don't read what's already there uh, they're right. probably not going to read this either and they'll probably just sign it but um, we'll see uh, chairman a, yes i just jump in at some point somebody's got to write this and if assuming public health asks for our assistance they do i i'm likely going to refer to 8, 15 872 and 15 873 those are the provisions about uh, let me get it for school immunization i'll just read so the board is aware 15-872 states uh, in relevant part b a pupil shall not be allowed to attend school without submitting documentary proof to the school administrator unless the pupil is exempted from immunization and then you go to the immunization statute uh, documentary proof is not required for a pupil to be admitted to school if one of the following occurs one, uh, there's a statement that the parent has to read and sign, stating they understand the risk and benefits of immunizations, or the school administrator receives written certification from a parent or doctor and a physician stating that they're exempt. I've paraphrased that. But that's essentially, if we're asked to help with the drafting of it, that's probably what I'm going to rely upon is those two statutes. The, I mean, that's what the law says. So I just want to be clear about that. Let me restate my motion. <laughs> Uh, we have to. I'll. Uh, that we will. Send my second. Yeah. The county health department will provide a statement that states the following: No law in the state of Arizona requires that individuals be vaccinated, neither adults nor children, and children may still attend school. End of quote. Okay. Is that? Does that go by legal? I, I don't, I'm not going to say yes or no, I have to look at it, but I, I don't think that it complies exactly with the statute saying there. I, respectfully, I think the statute, it's much more nuanced than that. It's, I mean, I'm, I'm just reading it verbatim here, and, and it, it says a pupil shall not be allowed to attend school without submitting documentary proof unless there's an exemption. So you cannot attend unless you provide an exemption, and an exemption would allow you to do that. I think that's my interpretation of what what it is. That was seventy or eight, uh, eight seventy three. Eleven eight. Excuse me. Fifteen dash eight seventy two, and then the exemption statute is fifteen dash eight seventy three. Which says those are the exemptions. Those those says a student is exempt, and 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 a student can be exempt if they just have to make sure that they submit this form. And these are for public schools. This is. It says for public schools. 
the, the parent or guardian of the pupil submits a signed statement to the school administrator stating that the parent or guardian has received information about immunizations provided by the Department of Health Services and understands the risks and benefits of immunizations and the potential risk of non-immunization and that due to personal beliefs, the parent or guardian does not consent to the immunization of the pupil. Or two, the school administrator receives written certification that is signed by the parent or guardian and by a physician or a registered nurse practitioner that states that one or more of the required immunizations may be detrimental to the pupil's health and that indicates the specific nature and probable duration of the medical condition or circumstance that precludes immunization. So the parents can opt out of the vaccine program. That's correct. It is. Okay. It just there has to be there has to be a documentary proof that's provided to the school. And I'll also note this was kind of brought up during the discussion that it under 15-872C, each public school shall make full disclosure of the requirements and exemptions as prescribed in those two statutes. So schools have to tell students these things. They have to tell the, the both of those, both the requirements are under 872 as well as the exemptions under 873. So, Chairman Angus. Yes. Wouldn't it be simpler just to leave things the way they are but provide these statutes to the parents when, when they come in? Nothing that they have to sign but just provide them as one of the handouts that we, we give? The schools give the same information, so it's just confirming what the schools are, have already told them and sent them to the health department, probably. These are the same schools that don't inform parents when their children are having problems. We're the ones that are administering, actually doing the deed. Okay, so we where, where are, are we? The health department. So where are we? What's the motion? So we have the motion. Yeah, we have the, the last motion. Okay, okay. can you reread the reread read the motion, please? So, um, Supervisor. <laughs> oh my goodness, Supervisor Gold, um, I have no law in the state of Arizona, or that will provide statements um, with no law in the state of Arizona requires individuals to be vaccinated, neither adult adult or children, to attend school. End quote. <laughs> Yes, yeah, Supervisor Lincoln. Madam Chair. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seconded this yet. Uh, my concern is with, with school children, and I'm willing to second something that basically says to go to a public school. If you, if you choose to homeschool, Attorney Esplin, then you, you don't have to get any vaccinations, correct? I don't know. I don't know the But answer. if you're going to attend a public school, you have to get the bare minimum of vaccines. Uh, from, um, what I, from, from what I'm reading, I don't know. That's what he just said. He just said you can opt out. You can, you can opt out. 15873 gives the parent the, um, they can uh, opt out of the vaccine program. So I would, I would, I would second something that is consistent with state statute, um, that they can they have to take a better minimum or they don't. But it, it needs to be consistent with state statute. Otherwise, it's, it's confusing. Give me a second. Right, so you call the question is no good. I'll second his motion. Call for the question. There we go. Okay. So we have a motion and we have a second. All in, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. No. Okay, so that failed. Is there anything else? Yeah. Chairman Angus, I make a motion that we uh, uh, make no changes to the current vaccination uh, procedure. Why would we need um, anyone have a second for that? Does this require a motion? Yes. I don't think so. Not, not to keep things the way they are. It requires a motion. But is there, so do you still want it that? Because there's no second. Do you want to keep that? In? And we could just take no action. Then, okay. And have the but same if result. we wanted to take uh, action, Chairman, yes. Um, I move that Attorney Esplin ret return in 30 days with model wording for a form that would require the signature of the person before having themselves or their child vaccinated by the county health department. Thank you. Second. We have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. Okay, that passed three to two. <clears throat> All right, uh, item 42.
Discussion possible action require all departments that are complaint driven to get a name, address, and phone number of the complaint before spending money to investigate. I, I just threw this on because I just wanted on the record what the county's policy is when it comes to complaints. Because over this year, especially for some reason, I've been getting a lot of people coming and calling me and saying that there's these anonymous complaints and they think it's this person retaliating. We've had this issue over the years. So I just wanted to know what the county's in, in development services and public health, what is, when people make a complaint, do they have to fill out a form? Do they have to give their names at least to the county? Yeah, Mr. Kingsley, Dr. Kingsley. I can speak for environmental health, which is in, we inspect restaurants, water systems, yes. and septic trucks. Um, we, we do not accept anonymous complaints. So anybody that comes, they do have to register, same as anybody that comes to the podium, they have to say, state their name. So they, anyone that comes to submit a, a complaint, they're in environmental health, does have to submit their name and, and, and the complaint so it's tied to a person. Okay. So no, no anonymous complaints are investigated. Well, that's good to hear. Thank you. How about development services? Development services. Director Walsh. Oh, there he is. Okay. Director Walsh is available. <laughs> Mr. Walsh. Chairman Angus, uh, members of the board. In development services, we do accept anonymous complaints. Um, basically, what we do is if we receive a complaint, we'll go out and verify it before we do anything. If that complaint is is verified, then we will follow up on it. Um, we do, we, we've had, I guess, how would you say, we, we've had, we can see both sides of the issue. Um, sometimes in, in dealing with some of the the dangerous buildings or zoning violations that we deal with um some of the neighbors are and can be intimidated by those uh violators and do not want to to provide their name um it doesn't discount that there's a violation there um so we have allowed for anonymous complaints in that um we do if if uh, if we receive a complaint from anybody, it does become, and, and we write their name down and, and contact information, it does become public record. And, and then if a, a public uh, public records request is submitted, um, we are obligated to provide that information as well. So um, with that, we have allowed um, anonymous complaints to be made and, and we, we inspect them all the same. How many do you get? A year, you think? Uh, just totally anonymous, without names. You know, I, I don't know that number right offhand. I I can look into it and find out and get back to the board, but I wouldn't How have that number How many of those, offhand. when you go out there, do you believe have been verified or correct? Is it a big number? You, you know, I'd ha I'd have to look at that one too. I I don't have those numbers specifically. I, I we could I, I could look talk with my staff and and do some research to see number of anonymous ones we get and then how many of those actually come true because we're using money to go and look at them when they don't have you know names on them the same as if people do leave names so you kind of you know you're of course you're making it easier to complain and this first reared its head during covid when uh restaurants were ratting out their competition and that was uh, very ugly so i just wanted to make sure that we have uh, um a very a uh, a policy that is across the board. I don't like anonymous complaints. Sometimes I can, I guess I can understand, but um, I wanted to hear what the rest of the board had to say. Anyone? Madam Chair? Yes. No, I agree that if people are going to make complaints, they should have to uh, file a written complaint with their name and that it, we don't have to divulge that to the, the person that the complaint's about, but I believe that they should. Um, have to at least sign their name to the form. Um, uh, Supervisor, uh, D Director Walsh, so if there is a public records request, can't the name be redacted? Or did people uh, have if a I may, I'll Chairman, I, I, I defer to, to County Attorney Esplin, but my understanding in, in working with the attorney's office is, is that the name would not be redacted. You know, personal information could be redacted, but their names specifically would not be. Okay. Uh, so that's generally correct. Uh, there's no statute that says that the name has to be redacted. We usually take the position that the name is not redacted, that it's a public record. Generally, courts want 
the things to be open that the that the county business is open to the public and and so uh, unless there's a specific exemption that says we have to redact it we're not going to redact it there is a catch-all uh, the, the Arizona courts have created a catch-all that where the privacy the, the the interests of privacy state interest and one other one the um, I can't remember what else but basically that, that sometimes we can we can do it on that catch-all but generally speaking we don't we if, if, if it's a name we don't redact the name but we will redact personal information if we have a, a date of birth or a social security number um, sometimes you know we will obviously redact those and then if there's a concern about safety or harm we may redact an address or a telephone number sometimes so we, we do sometimes this, redact those but not the names is this the policy of most counties is to take uh, anonymous complaints I, I, don't know. I don't know okay did you want to say something Ms. Esposito okay yes you did <laughs> thank you again Jennifer Esposito candidate for district 4 county supervisor this is something that I have been saying needed to be done a long time ago see all of you swore an oath to uphold the Constitution and people have a constitutional right to confront their accusers I mean that's cut and dried okay anonymous cannot testify against someone in a court of law and you know as someone who um, has had two anonymous complaints made against me ironically always when I run for office right run for office anonymous complaint to this I ran for office this year anonymous complaint uh, actually uh, dr. Kingsley was wrong because environmental services showed up at my property and when I asked you file the complaint they said I'm not allowed to tell you I can't tell you I said well and I, and I reiterated that to the nice woman that came out she left there was no basis to the complaint but the complaint was made after I pulled papers to run for office which just just seems how it happens an anonymous complaint was made against my opponent candidate Logan Marsh okay so in so many uh, of the issues that development services I think have has are anonymous complaints it's a complaint driven situation you know one neighbor gets in a quote pissing contest with another neighbor starts making anonymous complaints when the first one doesn't work they try the next one next department this department that department I think that while you should absolutely redact social security numbers or other information like that because you have a constitutional right to confront your accuser I think that everyone should fill out a form just like they would if they were reporting a crime and making a written report to the sheriff's department says I do declare under penalty of perjury that upon information and belief the foregoing is true and correct to the best of my knowledge and if that person files a frivolous complaint they should be prosecuted for false reporting to essentially law enforcement or enforcement officials that there that false reporting wastes the county's time it requires the hiring of more county employees whose salary and benefits have to be paid to go investigate more silly things and, and the other issue is that we do have uh, a right to equal treatment under the law so when we have these uh, departments that only do complaint driven things they are not actually um, treating everyone in the county equally and I'll give you a brief example and then I'll let it go if the county were to say have a policy that every restaurant should have a working fire extinguisher it would be equal treatment under the law to send an enforcement agent out once a year to check that every restaurant have a working fire extinguisher but when we have these ominous international codes and all this crazy stuff and you're enforcing them only on the person with the cranky neighbor or whatever but you're not going door to door making sure that everyone is following every iota of the international code or going door to door to make sure that everybody has a dog license or that everyone that needs a kennel license because they have more dogs than they should or whatever if you're not going to door to door you're not treating everybody equally but when you do do it complaint driven that person should be confident enough in their complaint that they're not wasting your time or anyone else's time that they would be willing to put that on the record and that's that's just the constitutional way to do it and that's all I'm going to say on that thank you Madam Chair? Yes, please. I don't even make people identify themselves with name and address when they come up here to the board to speak. Uh, we don't even make the people with their PCs give their information to become elected officials in the, in the county. So I have no problem if everybody's anonymous. Okay. Um, I brought this. Do you want to say something, Supervisor Gold? Yeah. Then? Um, I, I brought this I just wanted to know what the policy I'm, I don't want to do something like on the fly it's always bad to do that I'm gonna think about this and see 
if this is something we want to bring back and, and explore further. So I'm going to take no action on this one. Okay, so 43 is withdrawn, 44 is withdrawn, 45, discussion, possible action, approve ARPA funds from District 3. Going to be 44? 44 has been withdrawn. What has? Yeah. 43 and 44, and actually 40. Motion to approve on 45. Okay. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. We did 46. We're, if there's nothing else, we're adjourned.